listening to The Starting Zone, a podcast about World of Warcraft and the people who play it. And now, here are your hosts. Well, hello and welcome to The Starting Zone, the podcast about World of Warcraft and people who play it. Today is March 25th, 2024, and my name is Spencer Downey. Thank you so much for listening and subscribing to the podcast. I'm joined today... As always, by my co-host Jason Lucas. Jason, how are you doing on this fine Monday evening? Spencer, hello. Yes, it is evening. It has been a long mm. day. Uh, as you probably know, if you listen to the show, I get about two good hours of brain activity a day, and we're well outside those bounds. <laughs> yes, so we are. Good, good luck to all of you out there in podcast land. Um, it is March 25th, which is a very special day around here, mm. because mm. at least according to our Libs and RSS, March 25th was the date that the first episode was posted back in 2009. So Starting Zone is officially 15 years old now. Um, so happy birthday to you and to all of you listeners out there. And thank you, Mick and Jesse, for starting this whole project up all those many years ago. And, you know, we're now like seven and a half years into steering this ship. So we're like, you know, half of the whole show's like, time span in, in in addition to many many of the episodes so i think it's really cool i mean we've had some really good continuity considering what it takes to i mean and pretty much like laser focused on a single game the whole time i mean mick and jesse didn't put out episodes every single week like we do but they put out a lot of shows in a few years and you know it's not it, it, the format never really veered away from wow and I, you know, we're still here and we're still doing the thing and it's really cool. And a big part of that is because people are out there listening and, and they care about the show and they let us know about it. So, so thank you all for, for being with us on this whole journey with this show over the, over the many years it's been in production. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. Uh, I, as you mentioned that, I, of course, pulled up the show notes for that first episode way back in the day where they did a helping hand and the Razor's Edge and the Ministry of Truth Guild announcements. That took place during that, which I thought was interesting. So, yeah, the, the neatest thing about doing a show like this, I was actually just talking about this the other day, is the archive that you create, this little time capsule that we have. And I know that a lot of these old episodes are, you know, only half as long as they originally were because something weird happened with all the hosting and stuff that Mick and Jesse did back in the day. But uh, I will say that, uh, you know, that it's kind of neat to be able to go to startingzone.com and just do slash and then ep and then an episode number and you can pull up that episode like I, i've i've i went back put the work in and archived everything properly so you can actually go from episode one two three four see all the show notes see all the postings a lot of links are dead or you know old graphics don't work or they had sponsors that were like you know razor and whatnot back in the day that then didn't have stay sponsors so then like a link died and like there's a lot of weird stuff that happened with those posts but i'm not going to fix all that stuff for 600 ep well it'll be 360 something episodes but it is neat to see their show notes and uh listen what they were sort of read about what they were sort of going in to uh to sort of give tips and tricks on whatnot in this case they were talking about how to turn on instant quest text and how to put your character on auto run as well as buying gear for your local neighbor from your local neighborhood vendor and uh they also decide to throw a little bit of a breakdown on different levels of gear and their corresponding colors. So if you're talking about World of Warcraft back in the day, we're talking about the fundamentals here when it comes to that episode, you know, letting people know what a blue item means and what a green item means and what a white item means. Like that's, we're talking about fundamentals of that WoW. That is the man. legit starting zone Isn't right it? there, man, for sure. <laughs> so yeah, I think, uh, I think it's probably a good place to start for them. And I'm glad that they started it up and I'm, you know, honored to be taken over and carrying it on from there. So yeah, man, all right. But let's, uh, so before we dive into what we did last week in World of Warcraft, what's going on next week, I'm going to do like a, I'm, I'm prefacing the episode with the season of discovery news. I'm just going to do this right here so that like everything that happens after this is really defined and clear because we just got a post earlier today about season discovery. It's uh, actually a, not such a lengthy blog post, but the video itself contains a ton of information. We really want to break that down better. So we're going to do that next week because... They're kicking off Season of Discovery on the 4th of April. So that means that we have basically the 1st of April that we can record on and do an episode about what's happening for the launch of the 4th and talk about all that stuff. So we'll we'll do the Season of Discovery episode next week on the 4th. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, expect 10 levels. It goes up to level 50. There's going to be uh, a new raid. The raid's a 20-person raid. It's going to be on a weekly lockout. They're doing a raid lockout the very first week that it's out. We'll have opinions. We'll have thoughts. We'll have that stuff next week. So SOD stuff is then. For now, let's talk about what's going on this past week in World of Warcraft and I guess the new game mode Plunderstorm because we haven't talked about that either because when we last recorded, it wasn't out yet and we didn't know what it was. So now we get to actually talk about that on this episode. So Jason, what did you get up to this past week in World of Warcraft? Oh, I got you a little bit. Um, Tuesday raid was weird because we had like a decently sized group, but I had maybe like four or five people that were really just kind of along for the ride. So it started to feel kind of bad around Smolderon and then Farak just would not die. Uh, so that was kind of a bummer, but managed to get people back together for Wednesday to put Farak down. Somebody walked away with a myth track, uh, Augury of Primal Flame with Leech on it. Uh, not me, unfortunately, but one of our very extreme, like probably our best player got it. So I didn't feel too bad about not winning it. Cause it's like, yeah, he should have that. So, you know, just keeping the raid thing going, like we are cycling some new people in just to get them going, but it's hard, you know, it's, it's one thing to carry a couple people with like a 30 player raid and an extremely competent team around them. And when you're talking about like a sub 20 player team, you know, people that aren't contributing enough. It makes it hard on everybody, and then it's frustrating, and nobody's having fun, right? Um, you know, also, we had some huge problems on Tuesday with people's UIs. No PTR for the patch, you know, add-ons in various states of yeah. working or not yep. working. Like, stuff just wasn't... I, there was all kinds of weird UI bugs. It's even with, like, relatively stock UI element stuff was was going weird. So, um, you know, that was, that was a thing, but... You know, we did it. We, we're I, I'm perfectly fine, like I said on the show many times the last month and a half or so, just keeping it chill. Like, whatever people want to do is what we're going to do. I said when we had the, the crew assembled on Wednesday, like, we had not quite a mythic group. It was, like, 16 or 18 people and pretty good players. Uh, like, it could have been doable with a couple more. And I was like, hey, guys, sign up for Sunday. If you want to do mythic, we'll at least do first two or whatever so people get a box. Six signups. So, you know, no mythic team there, but that's okay. I, I didn't mind. Um, I did get like four keys in, which was cool to get. So I'll have a second choice tomorrow since I played two nights. It was an amazing Mythic Plus week. Felt wonderful. Very, very player friendly combo. And uh, I, I got to run with my rogue buddy who I mentioned the last few weeks. Um, got two more teleports for him. I think he's just got one left unless he did it without me in the last four or five days. So that's been awesome. I mean, I love playing with that dude. We always have fun together and it's cool to be able to be like, here, man, come do this. Like, get this cool reward for it. We'll help you out. Like, that's part of the that's part of the sauce. You know, that's why WoW is a cool game to play for 20 years, right? <laughs> like, it's those kind of connections you have with other people and, and helping other people get something cool or celebrating somebody else's success. So, you know, that was nice. Um, and then other than that, I, d I have been logging in daily for Plunderstorm purposes. <laughs> I, ha I, I have i have begrudgingly some, he says <laughs> yeah i have some really conflict like i i love the pirate theme okay and I, I love the way they do pirates in wow i think it's so fun and it's cool looking and i think the rewards for this event look incredible like the full mog set is just gorgeous and a lot of the other stuff is either really nice looking or really really strong thematically or just really fun i do not really actively want to be playing this game mode. Um, I just want the rewards from it. And like, if I'm going to be spending time in the, the WoW client, like I want to be playing my character and playing something that resembles WoW gameplay. Uh, it's sort of my like gut reaction to it. I think, you know, we'll talk about it a lot in this episode, obviously, but I was, <laughs> I, I was very disappointed at the announcement on Tuesday morning. Because, I mean, we were kind of talking about it last week, like, oh, well, what if it's something that, like, hooks into the core game or whatever? I, They had said it would be something that all subscribers could do, so I figured it would be something kind of cordoned off from, like, the main game areas or whatever. But I didn't think it would be something where your character's not even involved, right? So I don't I don't know. It's 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 cool that they're doing – I think they're bringing a lot of cool stuff into the game with this, te with this tech, like, with spectating and all that stuff, like, in, inside there and some of the other rules that they can break, that's really nice. Uh, it's not really what I want to be spending my time doing. There's, like, other games I want to be playing, you know? If I'm not doing WoW stuff, then I have other games to play, so... But I think the good thing is, for somebody like me, who, like, just wants to rack up the pirate stuff and doesn't care, like, 
it's not a, me- a mega time commitment, right? It's like a couple games a day. It's a, the games are a few minutes long. Get in there, PVE it up, and get out and see you tomorrow. And you should be in good shape for, you know, for as long as as the as the mode is available. So I don't know. It's 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 weird. I feel like this has been a very divisive introduction uh, into the game because people either like love this, like this is their life now is is plunderstorming or this is a blight on the game's history that never should have been introduced and everyone playing it is ruining world of warcraft or something right it's like it, it's the internet it has to be one of these two hyperbolic reactions i don't know i I'm, I'm definitely in the camp of like i don't like this and it's not what i wanted but i also have the collector wow brain disease where i have to play to get the rewards and i'm not sure that's really healthy for me <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> so that's why I'm not trying to sprint to 40 and just be done with it. I can do 15 minutes of plunderstorm a day and w- gradually work my way up and not put myself in a position where I'm inflicting psychic damage onto myself because I don't like this le- quote unquote leisure activity I'm doing. So uh, it's been a weird few days for me is what I'm saying. I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you on that. And yeah, I, I, I feel like before I even talk about how my week went i have to describe what plunderstorm is to a certain degree which i think is fine to do we're just going to do a little bit of that here and we'll talk more about it later on the show like you said so plunderstorm is a battle royale inside world of warcraft you lo- launch up your live game shadowlands game top left corner there's a, an actual icon you can click on that switches your like character select screen over to the plunderstorm character select screen you create a character there you join into the game. It doesn't have a class or anything attached to it. It's just a default World of Warcraft character with nothing attached to it. Join into the game. Instantly get knocked around by barrels into the water and have to try and swim out of the water. They, don't worry, they hot fix that. That's gone. We'll talk about that later. Um, but then you basically get dropped in on a parrot into uh, was the was it the Highlands? Is like where it's where you are. What was the actual? Is Rathi Rathi Highlands? That's where we are. Yes, it's, yeah. I mean, it's pretty much the, it's like the Arathi Highlands a rework from BFA, right? Yeah. With, a, you know, kind of that layout and um, what am I trying to say? Like the, the way the buildings are set up and everything, all those assets. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I, I'm i not going to say it's it's one-to-one identical, but I'm pretty sure it is. It seems like the exact same zone from the BFA rework. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So anyways, you drop into that map uh, and you are among 60 other players and whether you are choosing to queue up with someone else inside a duo situation, so it's two, uh, essentially teams, th- th- 30 teams of players or individual 60 players, drop into the map. There are elites to kill. There are normal mobs to kill. And when you kill them, they drop loot and it's plunder basically is the whole concept behind Plunderstorm. And as you pick up this uh, loot and as you kill mobs, you gain experience. And another thing that drops are abilities. And you can have five abilities, uh, two of them being offensive, two of them being more utility based and one of them being a tool. And tools can be escape items or you know big time slow items, items that trip people up. And, and, and items that affect like a general area of the map. Like, hey, there's going to be a barrage of cannon fire that hits this area of the map. Everyone needs to dodge it, including yourself. That kind of idea as far as a tool goes. Uh, and basically on this map, the goal is to level up by killing and getting as much experience as possible while also getting a sort of different abilities onto your ability bar, picking up the same ability more than once, upgrades that ability up to a four times. There's four tiers of each ability and they get more powerful. And you just can attack other players and defeat other players and they'll all of their loot that they've collected will spill out all over the ground. That player will be kicked back to the lobby screen unless they're in a duo situation where their friend could technically resurrect them if their friend ends up managing to either sneak around long enough to be able to do that or defeating you and uh, then being able to resurrect their friend. While the circle of the map shrinks, it picks areas of the map where the circle that is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And if you are outside of that, you're inside of the storm. That's the storm part of the plunder. And uh, you will slowly die or quickly die, depending on how late in the game it is, if you're out inside the storm. So it forces all the players together in the middle of the map. The last team or individual standing wins. And uh, that's the whole concept of what Plunderstorm is, uh, which is basically a battle royale for WoW. And so I uh, did not dive into this until last weekend. Uh, I spent the first part of my week finishing up the Hearthstone rewards because I talked last week on the show that I was still struggling to get some of those. 
I did manage to get all of the rewards. It took a very long time. There were many, many, many kills. Crap. Like days and days and days of like probably 50 or 60 kills. Wow. It was a lot oh, of kills sucks. to get all wow. the rewards. It, it took a long, well, it was a you long got time. It, it, they're worth yeah. it. They're like if anything's worth it, I think they are. Yeah. So I, I was very happy to have all that done. It, it actually went on long enough that I probably killed the, the boss five or six times more than I needed to because I just wasn't sure if I actually had everything. I, I was like searching for the hearthstone inside my toy box to be sure I had it. I was searching for like, mounts. I was searching right. for like, do I have everything? I'm not sure. I've killed it so many times now. I've lost track. And they don't and they don't have like a tag for the event loot for that. And good luck searching for hearthstone in your toy box. Yeah. Well, it's not even hearthstone because it's not even a hearthstone. It's a, it's the, it's the stone of the stone hearth. of hearth. So <laughs> if you, if you search for hearthstone, hearthstone in your you, toy box, you don't see it. You'll get, <laughs> you don't you'll see get like it. 30 hearthstones and yep. some of them are hearthstone themed, but you won't get the stone of the hearth. Exactly. So it, th there was that other factor as well. So yes, there was some shenanigans that happened there, but I finished that off when I hit the weekend. I was like, all right, I got to check out this plunderstorm thing and see what's going on with it. I hadn't touched it at all. Friend of the show, Devalor, Josh, uh, Lore, whoever you're, you want to, whatever an AKA name you want to go by, was had played it a whole bunch earlier in the week. And so I decided to hop in with him uh, as sort of my like, hey, he can be my, my guide to figuring this whole thing out. And I think I did, I want to say like 14 levels in that one play session, which was pretty fast. Uh, so I was kind of surprised about that. At that point, they'd done, because it was in the weekend, they'd done a bunch of tuning already. So there was already like a leveling rate adjustment and the, the daily quest reward had been put in and some stuff had gotten buffed because there was a lot of issues early on with experience, gain rate, and et cetera, et cetera. And we'll talk about that more in the show. But yeah, so it, it, it I jumped in with him at a really good time in duos. And then I tried to do solos and was like, this is horrendous. I really dislike this game mode. <laughs> um, when you're playing with other people, this is substantially more fun when you have like voice comms and they're a friend and you're goofing around and you're having a good time and you can organize a bit and try to like sync up your builds and try to sync up what what uh, abilities you're taking and, and sort of time things out. So like they're gripping someone in as you're queuing up a stun and then like you sort of like chain things together and have a really good time doing that. Like that was fun. And learning the game that way was fun. I jumped into him, jumped into a, uh, it again with him the next day, and I pushed up into the twenties, which felt really good. Uh, and we had a good time. We did win. We did have a, have a, a win, so we did get the feat of strength for winning, which was nice. Um, but uh, in general, it's uh, it's a game mode that I, I agree with Jason is very controversial at the moment as far as whether people like it or not. I I think I I am a believer that the I think the rewards they attach to the to this game mode for outside of this game mode rewards should have been like a five hours to earn thing. I think players should be able to get on in one to two days, do a play ses session, earn all the rewards that they could earn, get a good taste of what Plunderstorm is, and decide if they want to keep playing it. And for people who chose to keep playing it, there could be rewards that are earned inside Plunderstorm, or there could be, you know, feats of strength, things like that, the players outside of that don't really care that much about. There are some people who care about a feat of strength. It's just a very low number compared to like a mount or an entire transmog or pets or things that people highly collect and feel they need to have are challenging to be like, yes, we're going to put this behind a 30 to 40 hours of gameplay gate is essentially what they were doing initially. And so you're like, okay, well, this is a lot to ask your average player to do. And you can say it's out for two months or three months, whatever it is that the window of time that it's out for and make the argument of, Oh, that's only like six hours a week or whatever it is that you're trying to do the math on. And you're like, that's a lot of time. Like you have to recognize a lot of players play this game like six hours a week total. Like that's their gaming time. Like that's what they have to do. And you're asking them to take all that time away from raid and other things that they were doing that they were enjoying gaming wise and put it all into Plunderstorm, which might be a game mode they don't enjoy that much. And so I, I do feel like all of those rewards should have been on a substantially reduced period of time that you could actually earn them all in. And I think you'd then see a very different opinion about Plunderstorm as a whole, because I think a lot of the negative feelings about it come from people feeling like they have to play it, like it's Torghast and it's a chore and I don't want to have to do it. It's a fun game mode when there wasn't anything attached to it. You attach things to it and now it's a chore and I don't want to do it, I think is where a, a large group is coming from. And that group is creating 
an environment for players who do enjoy it that those players are now angry and upset about because this is what's happening. Players who are just in there for the grind go into the match, try to complete their quest, try to gather as much stuff as possible, get chased by players who actually want to play the game mode and decide, I just want to die as fast as possible, so I'm just going to run into the storm and die. And so they run into the storm and die because that way they die as fast as possible. And if this person wants to chase them halfway across the map, then they're wasting their time and they're not experiencing up and they're not going to have a very good match anyways because they've now chased me across the map. And if I die outside in the zone, they can't get my stuff anyways. So ha ha ha, I've now screwed them over, right? And you're like, okay, so that's upsetting the players who actually want to play the game. <laughs> so you have this like these two sides of the field of like people who want to play the game mode and are engaged in it and love it and people who dislike it and they're spoiling it for the people who like it but they're only there because they want the rewards. So Blizzard just needs to give them all of the rewards so they go away. And then the people who enjoy the game mode can enjoy the game mode. And I, I, it's just, it's an unfortunate circumstance that they created, but I'm, I'm hoping they continue to look at buffs and, and whatnot to experience to just sort of, or, or the progression rate of, of this renowned system so they can just get people through it so that these people can get out of it so that the people who enjoy it can just keep playing it. Because there's a lot of people who just enjoy the game mode for what it is. They don't need the outside of game motivator to play it. They just want to play it because they enjoy it. And I, I do feel like all of, all of the people who feel this is a chore are kind of souring that environment and being sour themselves, rightfully so, for feeling they have to be in there doing this. So I know it's a bit of a, a bit of a rant at the start, and I know we're going to talk a lot more about Plunderstorm later in the show, but I felt it was important to describe what it was and then what my experience was. So that's that. That's the start of the Plunderstorm, and we'll we'll dig into it a little bit more. We'll have tips and tricks and different ideas and things that I really enjoy about it as we sort of dig into this a little bit more and get farther into the show. All right. Well, uh, I mean, that's what I got up to this past week in World of Warcraft. So let's do what's going on this week in World of Warcraft. We'll hop into some of the notes and updates and all sorts of fun stuff, including subscription number estimates that we got that were going on, which is pretty neat. So we'll check all that out right after this. All right, this week in World of Warcraft, the uh, the weekly event going on is the Dragonflight Dungeon event, meaning that Dragonflight Dungeons drop an additional piece of loot at the end of the dungeon, except for inside Mythic Plus modes, as well as uh, there's a quest to complete four Mythic difficulty dungeons that rewards a heroic Amir to Soul Treasures cash. The weekly other event is go we that we have this week is also the Pet Battle Bonus event, because they always try and pair the Pet Battle Bonus event up with something else, which I feel like was directly a result of our complaining, Jason. I feel like that came as a direct oh, sure. TSD influence. Yeah, whoever's in charge of rewards or events or whatever, obviously a TSD listener, like, yeah, that's right. Pet battle is way too niche. We gotta we gotta have it on its own rotation mm -hmm. and it's gonna just drop in with other stuff on the calendar. So Yeah. Yeah, that is a great thing because it was like a a week without a, an event for those of us who don't really do anything with pets, right? I like to collect them, but I don't want to battle them and level them up. Like, it's just, I I love Pokemon. I'd rather just play a Pokemon game than do that inside my WoW. I want to play my WoW character. We're, we're sensing a theme here for this week. Well, um, yes, yes. But yes, it's good. It's great with Dungeon uh, dungeon Event. It's perfect. You get something for in-game PvEers. You get something for collectors and people who are maybe just, you know, into the, the kind of side systems. Really good chance to get... You know, some relevant gear. I mean, you could do four Mythic Zeros pretty easily, Amir Dressil gear. You know, obviously we're getting late in the season now, but if you're trying to get the tune set up for to jump into season four and get started, like this could be a really good event to take advantage of. Yes, it certainly could. Uh, the The other factor with this that we always brought up was the reward for winning five PvP pet battles during this event, the, the very best quest that you can pick up, uh, is that you instantly train one pet to level 25. I still think they could look at that and make that like four pets to level 25 something like that because it's just cost 60 pet battle training stones to buy a level 25 upgrade and you can earn that pretty easily and so if you're someone who really does a lot of pvp pet battles all the, or just a lot of pet battles in general all the time these stones are fairly easy to get it doesn't feel like as rewarding like think about it the dragonflight dungeon event is giving you a piece of heroic raid loot right like that's what you're getting out of <laughs> out of doing that reward for the week for doing for we're winning five PvP pet battles, you get one stone that takes you maybe an hour and a half, maybe, to earn that one stone. Just doing like out in the world, like daily quests that are like insta solve basically, because you've already figured out what pets beat 
the trainers that are out in the world to get your stones to be able to buy this, you know, training stone. So I feel like they get up that reward for winning five PvP bet battles to actually make it more enticing for players to get in there and do it. Because otherwise, you know, just doing the normal. Yeah, well, I mean, plus the passive bonus is huge, right? Didn't it used to be 50% years ago and then they, they boosted it to 100%? Well, that's huge. So like, yeah, that's everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Like you just let you level up so fast anyway. It's like who even cares about doing the event? Because if you want to, it might be faster or certainly less stressful, right? You don't have the PvP element. You do it at your pace. You know, you just get a ton of pet XP just from level them up like you would through battling. So I don't know. It's yeah. it's a weird event, and these are all reasons why it is no longer its own event for the week. This is why it's always with something else. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, we also have, uh, obviously, the the regular checklist you want to go through, picking up your Aiding the Accord quest, picking up your PvP quests, including the PvP Brawl, which is Warsong Scramble. If you queue into a PvP Brawl for the week, you'll get the quest for Warsong Scramble to win one of these brawls, which is the Something Different quest, which is use of Marks of Honor, Conquest, and Honor. And Warsong Scramble is Warsong Gulch that's been altered as far as the rules go. The flags are now closer to each base. The goal is to just cap the flag 10 times and you you don't have to have the flag present in order to cap on top of it. And there's power ups inside the battlefield. So it's just a mad dash sprint. It's actually a way to earn a lot of honor really quickly if you happen to be on the winning team because you can just mad dash flag so quickly and get wins so fast that you're going to earn a lot of uh, a lot of honor that way. So if that's something you're looking to do, get yourself some more song scramble. Obviously, also go out there and knock out your Orastar the Hibernator, the big rune bear in the Emerald Dream, chance at some 441 loot, as well as that rune bear appearance. If you're someone who wants the rune bear form, be sure you're still knocking this boss out. And then Mythic Plus affixes for the week are Tyrannical, Afflicted, and Bolstering, meaning bosses have increased health and deal increased damage while in combat. Afflicted souls appear and seek the aid of players, and when any non-combat, sorry, non-combat, any non-boss enemy dies... It's death cry empowers nearby allies, temporarily increasing their damage by 20%. Okay, so tyrannical, boss is going to be a little bit more rough. Afflicted, boss is going to be a little bit more rough. And trash is going to take a little bit longer. Bolstering, just be a little bit more careful on trash that you're not getting your tank one shot by killing a bunch of low little trash and then having one build a boss mob that can just one shot things. However, bolstering doesn't last forever and will wear off. So if you get into a bad situation, you can cc that mob or bring that mob around there's nothing stopping you from ccing the mob so i almost feel like the hardest part this week is just making sure you have a group that can deal with afflicted well right jason pretty much this is you know comp dependent it's a comp dependent week because i can't do anything about an afflicted mob i just gotta hope that somebody else can aid them because i can't so that feels bad and that means that certain glasses are gonna have a hard time finding a spot in you know dungeon finder groups uh, because why would I bring a warrior if I could bring a paladin? I wouldn't probably. So, yeah, I, afflicted stinks. I just I, I think it's maybe the worst affix because of the comp dependency that it injects into the system. But overall, I don't think this is a bad tyrannical week. I mean, bolstering is obviously a non-factor in boss fights. Afflicted will occur during boss fights, um, and you do you know you need something set up to take care of this. Uh, Poison Cleanse Totem is pretty busted. Um, Revival's pretty good, too. But you probably want to have at least one, if not two, uh, non-healers that can they can assist with this as well. And, yeah, bolstering, the only thing... Really, the bad part about bolstering, it's a tyrannical week, so you have way more wiggle room, right, to bolster something up because you're not starting at that higher base damage to begin with. The really bad thing is not so much like your tank getting killed... But it's if you have something to cast like volleys or like spam casts at random targets and they start getting bolster stacks and their damage just keeps going up and up and they start picking people off, that really stinks. And that's probably the that's probably like the only dangerous part about bolstering this week is if you have a pack like that. So what should you do? You should kill casters first. Anything that like casts or doesn't won't follow the tank around to melee the tank, kill that first. If you bolster stuff that just melees, it's fine. Your tank has armor. Your tank has mitigation. You know, that's that's what your tank is there for. So pick off those casters. Pick off those like ranged attackers that like to disengage and do some kind of bar- barrage or something like that. Don't let them get bolstered up because they're the ones that are going to wreck the rest of your party. But yeah, I mean, beyond that, you know, the typical caveat, of course, is a tyrannical week. 
you you may hit a point where there's just a boss you can't kill because it's beyond your team's capabilities. And that is that is the part that sucks about Tyrannical Weeks. But overall, I you know, I think as long as you can counterplay afflicted, I think this is a fine week. We'll see. I don't. I don't. I don't know what my plans are for this week. I. I. I, I am sort of in a spot where I'm. I'm hoping for a, a one, a one night, uh, you know, raid and dungeon week. Uh, because I'm just kind of done with this season, and so we'll see if I end up. I'm sure I'll hop in there in some fashion tomorrow night, and you know, we'll have to figure out who's on afflicted duty because it ain't going to be me. Yeah, and, and I agree. I think it's a great tyrannical week when it comes down to it. Because you should have your afflicted situation sorted out when you get in there with a the team. I, I'm i very much looking forward to afflicted being gone. <laughs> it's Tam in general. I think they could phase it out Fingers at any time and it'll yeah. be fine. So I'm hoping that happens for everyone's benefit. Uh, micro, well, actually just normal holiday kicking off on April 1st is Noble Garden. So if you're someone who still needs Noble Garden rewards, be sure that you're taking advantage of that because, uh, yeah. Monday, April 1st, all that kicks off. So we'll be recording on that day, which means we probably won't have the information yet about what's happening for Noble Garden, but we'll be sure that we get as much as we can and cover it and remind everyone so they, they can hop in and get all the eggs that they need to be able to purchase all the things that they want. I have a feeling that all of us are in this category you speak of, of people that need Noble Garden stuff, because I'm pretty sure this got a bunch of new stuff. Yeah. Um, we don't know. Well, obviously, we haven't seen it in, you know, in the holiday rotation yet and i haven't been like i don't really look at data mining and i'm i haven't like dug around in like game in game collection panes and stuff mm -hmm. but um i'm pretty sure there is new stuff for noble garden i hope that you know i actually really liked the rework that they did for love is in the air and i would like something similar for noble garden noble garden is not my favorite in-game holiday and i probably told the story in the show many times about how it was the one that broke me the yep. first year I tried to yep. do Long Strange Trip, which was doing all the meadows for all the in-game holidays. And I just could not sit there and click chocolates anymore. And I was like, screw this. I'll do it some other time. Um, so it came all the way around to the next year. And Noble Garden was the last one that I hadn't done, um, which kind of made it hurt even worse. Um, so, you know, some of these in-game events are really moldy. And they, they have different ways to tell stories or give players stuff to do in-game now. So I'm interested to see what they've done with it. I, I hope it's got a nice new coat of paint and, you know, hopefully some cool new rewards to, to, to check off. I don't know that Noble Garden theming is really kind of my lane, but Oof. I do like collecting stuff, though. I, I will say, if Noble Garden theming isn't your thing, there's a good chance that we might see Trading Post stuff also announced on April 1st, and there may be some Noble Garden themed stuff in there, potentially. So That's if true, Love is yeah. in the Air month told us anything... There may be something that happens in April that might be bunny themed and we might see some bunny stuff, which I would be uh, okay yeah. with. So. I don't really want my make my character a bunny. That's not on, enough, high right. on my list, but no. what would be really funny is if a, they a, did a rabbit mount. I mean, I'm known for a rabbit mount. Let's oh, that, that well, yeah. I mean, I've done that before, yeah. right? With yeah, yeah. the, the uh, Lunar New Year mount yeah. a couple of years ago or whenever that was. They should do like a April Fool's trading post. Like the first day yeah. of the month. It's just all stuff that's not actually there. So you can't buy anything. It's, it's, it's all, all free. Goofy. It's all free it's, things that aren't actually there. Yeah. Like this, <laughs> it's like goofy stuff that, you know, you wouldn't actually want anyway. It's just all joke items or whatever. Yeah. That's way too much work it's for just, them to actually just, do. Li but. Literally, literally you open up the uh, trading post and it's all shark fins and bat guano and like the yeah. whole thing. Oh, is, how good would that be? Right. It's just all I'm like. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> wild players would have a very normal reaction I'm to sure that. I'm sure they would. The yep. so, it would be fine. Yeah, yep. they should do that. Yep. I, I would get a kick out of it, you know? I, I fully approve of putting Bat Guano on the trading post for April 1st. <laughs> uh, yeah, so as long, as long as it was not actually spending your currency to purchase it, I think it'd be hilarious uh, to allow you to do that. You can only purchase one, purchase one of each, so, like, really, what are you giving away to people by putting, like, pet rocks and all that kind of stuff in there. And then people can buy up all these grays and sell them off and get less than a gold worth of coin for selling them off. That's fine. Uh, I think that would be a, a hilarious thing to do on April fools. If that's what they're going to do. All right. Uh, hot fixes for the week. Uh, we have some dungeon hot fixes that came in here. Speaking of afflicted, the afflicted cast time has been increased to 12 seconds from 10 to buy people that little bit more time to actually deal with it, which is great. And they also have listened to us, for Incomporeal, the, uh, the spawns are now closer to the group's general location. Uh, the changes above were originally intended, so in other words, the ones for Afflicted and Incomporeal. 
uh, originally intended for season four, but they've decided to move them sooner because players would prefer that they move them sooner, as I said. So, yes, uh, we are seeing a change to those two. They also addressed an issue with Afflicted's the, cry debuff. These are... Yeah. These are not the afflicted and incorporeal hot fixes I wanted, but I'll no, take them. I, I want them out. I want them out entirely. But I'll say, like, sure, anything, anything is good. Move it up, please. Um, they address an issue with afflicted's cry debuff duration. Uh, it was increased to two seconds instead of uh, its cast time. So the actual cry duration was increased. Suppose its cast time increased. So that was a bug. That was not not what they wanted to do. They didn't want to make it an even worse debuff. So yeah, now it's now it's bad. Yeah, could you imagine? This is funny too because it kind it kind of got I guess it got pushed live like that or it got yep. data mined or something, and you know it was it was one of those twenty four hour freak Panic outs over the, windows, the, yeah. the state of PVE tuning. But yeah, yeah, luckily that was just the number was in the wrong cell in the spreadsheet or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. a little bit more time to react to afflicted is good. I, I don't know when incorporeal is up next. It's got to be soon because it's only a 10 week rotation. We haven't seen it in a minute. So yeah. uh, I'll be interested to see how that is because sometimes, man, those things spawn like way behind the group or like in a really weird part of the train where it's hard to see it or react to it. So I think it should help. I mean, obviously if they spawn right on top of players, then that cuts down a bit of the, challenge that the ethics represents right so like they can't just straight up do that they have to have some randomness to where they appear but right yeah having them having them tighter to the group sounds like it'll be a lot easier to deal with yeah uh they also fix an issue that would cause some raid bosses to not drop tier tokens um yeah that's a problem in general let's just you know actually have that fixed kind of like i guess it is yeah <laughs> i mean like it's it's not intended behavior right at this point yeah. in the season like, yeah, I mean, you have yeah. you probably have catalyst charges. You probably have ways to get items to sure. get what you want to do. But they are supposed to drop them, you yep. know, so they I guess they weren't. Nope. They also fixed a bug that would cause some gear to unintentionally become as powerful as it will be at the season four start. Uh, so they've set these back to season three levels for the rest of season three. Yeah, you shouldn't shouldn't be getting season four gear. Uh, in season three i uh so. unfortunately did not experience this bug but that sounds great <laughs> that sounds hilarious it's just here i finished a mythic plus dungeon oh hey look i got an item with 50 extra item levels on it great that's an upgrade <laughs> yeah no that's uh that, that got resolved i don't know let me let me sim it let me sim it first <laughs> that's exactly oh my god oh dear um all right so now we're sort of starting to dip our toe into plunderstorm all right so there's a, a large amount of stuff here to cover as far as plunderstorm goes Starting with some of the hot fixes they put out here, uh, they did in fact make it so that the MMR for players matchmaking is better. Yeah, it's actually a better system so that you're more likely to be paired up with people who are on similar skill level as you when you're actually entering matches. Uh, so that actually went live and helped and, and fixed a lot of stuff for people. They also fixed an experience bug uh, when doing uh, duos where uh, essentially increasing experience gain at level three was borked. So they fixed that which was good to see. They had a whole bunch of, of firewall adjustments for people who were using the firewall damage. Um, stuff like where they just reduced the damage by a whole bunch and they were looking at tweaking movement speed, but they didn't. It was primarily just damage stuff that they reduced. Um, they did, in fact, reduce some of the movement speed. It was 70%, I think, was the initial reduction. It still increases your movement speed, so you still move faster than someone who's just running around. So it is still a powerful spell, but that's one of the things they adjusted. They also went in and tweaked a whole bunch of other abilities, which by this point is a little bit stale for people who've actually been doing it a lot. Another one I would want to highlight, though, is that Fey form, the actual sh shifting into a Fey and, and traveling around. Um, it now only provides 50% damage reduction as opposed to 90% damage reduction. So if you're someone who was really counting on that, that's another one that's a, a big decrease in change. So uh, those Plunderstormers out there, you got yourselves a couple of hot fixes that happened early last week that we wanted to throw in there because it was part of the hotfix notes. So how that fits in. All right. So, I think they even pushed some of these over the weekend, man. So, yeah, um, yeah. you know, uh, shout out to team two, because obviously there's a lot of expectations of any kind of content release. I think they, they pushed something like late Friday or was it even Saturday? I can't remember, but yeah, I mean, because they were, they were pushing stuff very late in the week and I'm sure it's, I'm sure it was a, it was a, uh, a long week over there in, in live ops, standing this up and reacting to stuff. I mean, again, this is a patch with no PTR, right? And yep. and that was sort of, I don't know if they've, if they never did that before, but if they, if they haven't done it in a long time and 
less stuff kind of broke than I guess I thought would, but I'm sure it was a, it was a busy week and getting a lot of tuning changes in like under the wire too. So it's cool. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, a, a lot of this stuff is, is necessary, right? Like having MMR ratings so that players are getting into more fair matches. It's huge for a game mode like this. And, um, yeah, there was something up with duos where people could essentially power level themselves at level three yeah. by grabbing a bunch of plunder. Specifically, at level three would break things. Yeah, yeah. And so what that what that was doing was it was just short circuiting the way like the overall rhythm of the games. It was making the games just kind of like power spike out of control and yeah. end quickly or or in ways that they weren't really happy with. It was like short circuiting the experience. So well, yeah, it, was, it wasn't just that. It was people were essentially finishing their progression of renown substantially faster, which seemed yeah. really weird. Like there was, there was a whole other thing where it's like, Oh, this becomes the correct way to do something. Right. That is a problem you have to resolve. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it, cause you assume that you're getting more plunder if you're getting more XP. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so there's, you know, plunder converts into yeah. renown rep at one to one. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, o overall that should, bring it more in line with the kind of power curve uh, uh, from a, a solo game. Yeah. Um, I, also, the immune knockbacks uh, in, in the lobby. The, thanks yes, for that one. That was I a big mean, one. I would only ever knock people around once somebody would complain about getting oh knocked around. Oh my goodness, Jason. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be the first one to do it, but what? once people start doing it and if How are you playing this I'm, game I'm, mode with chat on? What are you doing? I'm getting, well, I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not chat. It's just slash say. Like, I, I can know. you even turn that I off? Know. Like, I don't, yep. I don't know. But yeah, I, you know, I'd be perfectly behaved until somebody started complaining about the barrels and then my barrel's going. Sorry. Yeah. All right. But now all it right. doesn't matter. You know, you can stand there and, and talk to, uh, to Cash all you want to. Yes. Yeah, so all right, so let's, let's, before I dive into some more notes about this, let's talk a little bit more about Plunderstorm in general. When you actually queue in, there is an NPC in front, in front of you, and you will have a quest that actually requires you to talk to that NPC so that you can find out where they are and what they do. They allow you to pick different appearances for your weapon, for your gun, for your armor, what pet you want to follow you around. There's a, a, a bunch of customizations you can actually pick for your character in that. Um, so just knowing where that person is, is important. Also lets you check the progression of your renown. However, you can do that as well by just clicking on the renown icon or going into Dragonflight and going to the inn in Valdraken and talking to the guy in there who will also show you that, which is an interesting thing. Um, and will also give you rewards. Like I got a whole bunch of, uh, trader's tender that I've earned so far from progressing that renown track, which was an interesting thing to be earning while I was doing Plunderstorm. So that was kind of neat. Uh, yeah, so once you're inside that sort of starting area, you do, in fact, get dropped in, as I said earlier, and once you're dropped in, uh, so let's start leaning a little bit into tips here. The elites on the map are guaranteed to drop an ability of some kind, so when you're actually dive bombing with your parrot, you want to aim, look at your mini map, and aim for a star. Those stars are all the elites. And just try and hit a star with your parrot because it will one shot that elite. You'll get the experience immediately for killing the elite. And you can just pick up an ability right away and actually have some way of having an edge against someone who lands right next to you who did not kill an elite. And have an ability that you can use that hopefully either means you can beat them up or escape from them easily or slow them down, whatever it ends up being. Or just kill other mobs faster with this ability. Uh, that comes to tip number two, which is level up as quickly as possible. Uh, the amount of games that will happen where you end up being level six or level seven in the final 12 teams and it's like, or final 12, you know, individuals that are out there and it's like level 10, level 10, level nine, level eight, level nine, level 10, level nine. You're like, okay, I, I'm dead. There's no way I can beat any of these people. And the only solution I have is to hide in a bush or hide somewhere and wait and see if there's a moment of opportunity where I can sort of jump in and third party a group, uh, in other words, be the third person fighting inside of a fight between two people and hopefully come out on top of both of them because they beat each other up so much and then run around and collect all their plunder and maybe get to level eight where then I can actually compete with some of these other people a little bit better, even though a level 10 will still beat you up, you know, readily if you are level eight. So uh, leveling up is very important. The key ways to level up are opening chests. Uh, there are golden chests and epic chests and green chests and blue chests spread out all over the map. These chests should be a priority. The green, blue, and epic each drop a uh, ability of that particular type. So either a tier two ability at green, a tier three ability 
at uh, blue and a tier four ability at epic. Um, so open these chests if you can. They also spill plunder all over the ground. Any plunder that spills on the ground that has a goblet in it. So in other words, plunder, there's just like a pile of gold and there's a pile of gold that has like a goblet and a plate and other stuff in it. Those ones are actually worth experience. So if you're actually gathering up plunder and you see that there's like a couple pieces of plunder on the ground, but someone's coming in to get you and you got to get out of there, grab those ones first and then leave because you'll get experience off those ones and plunder off those ones and you'll actually be able to progress yourself faster. And if you leave a bunch of, you know, three or four piles of gold on the ground, not a big deal comparatively to leaving those goblets on the ground. So be sure you're picking those up. Uh, that, that's another good one for you. Uh, elites are worth a lot of experience, but more importantly, they're how you find those abilities consistently. So certain areas are going to be what I would call a hot drop, where basically you're dropping into an area where a lot of other people are dropping and everyone's trying to get an elite and everyone's trying to fight the elites, but they are a very fast way to level up. So the horde town that's there, the fortress that's there and the alliance fortress that's there, dropping into either of those, they're just full of elites. Um, there's a few other areas. I like the spot that's just outside of the Alliance town. There's like a horde, like assault area uh, that's right outside of the Alliance uh, vill sort of fortress. And there's a ton of elites there and people don't tend to drop there as often. So often I can drop in there, kill a whole bunch of stuff that's there, kill a bunch of elites that are, get a whole bunch of abilities and then go into the fortress for the Alliance stuff and fight the people in there and be fairly progressed along. But yeah, I would I would put chests as a very high priority. Um, getting those epic chests or green chests or blue chests are a fairly high priority because they're a lot of experience and you get a really good ability out of it, or at least a higher ranked ability out of it. Um, the abilities rank up based off the ones you pick up off the ground. So if I have a ability, uh, let's say Rhyme Arrow is what I have, and another one drops, I can essentially run over and pick up that other one. And if I had a tier one and I pick up another one that's a tier one, it becomes a tier two. And you can essentially level things up and progress those along to being epic, which is the tier four, which comes out of the epic chess, uh, just by picking up stuff off the ground. So often towards the end of a match, a lot of people have died. If they've died in an area that hasn't been swallowed by the storm, you can run around and pick up all their stuff and level up all your abilities and trade out your abilities. Um, trading out your abilities is a bit of a tricky thing that I feel like they need to work on the lagginess and UI elements of. Uh, there's two ways to do it. You can run up to an ability and press tab and it will cycle between which slot you're going to replace on your bar with that ability. Um, if you already have two abilities in there, otherwise you just pick it up and it goes into the empty slot. Uh, you can use your mouse cursor to drag items around on your bar to sort of order them the way you want to be. Um, obviously there's two slots that are dedicated to each type and then one tool slot. So be sure that you're only trying to move them into those slots, otherwise it won't work. What I prefer to do when I'm swapping in abilities is to click on the ability of my bar and drag it off of my bar and drop it on the ground. Because then I guarantee the thing that I'm picking up is going to go into that space, as opposed to me accidentally dropping the thing that I really wanted to keep and keeping the thing I didn't want to, but getting the new thing, um, which a lot of people sort of suffer through. So I just drag stuff off my bar anytime that happens uh, so that I'm actually able to be sure I'm getting rid of something and picking something else up. When you're playing in duos, it's really helpful because you can give stuff to your friend. So when we're out killing stuff and something drops and I have space to pick it up, I can pick it up and carry it over to my friend and drop it for him and he can upgrade the thing that he has and everyone's kind of happy and you're helping each other out. And like I said, putting together those builds that line up where one person's taking the chain that pulls the hunter's chain that pulls someone in and someone's taking Earthbreaker, which stuns people. And you watch someone throw the chain to grab someone and you hit your Earthbreaker. So it's starting to build up and they pull the person into your Earthbreaker and they get stunned and then you can beat the person up. That's why I like duos a lot. Duos just feels better to play, to be honest, than a solo environment. Not to mention, if you die inside duos, your friend can come over and resurrect you. They can stand on you for 15 seconds, pouring booze down your throat, which is apparently what they decided was a resurrection spell. Pirates, right? And then you get rezzed and then you're up again. And, you know, yes, all your stuff spilled out on the ground. So the people who killed you might have taken your stuff, but you can sort of collect up stuff again and sort of get yourself moving along again. I will say when you are downed, you do not gain experience. So if your friend is running around doing a whole bunch of stuff, they might get one or two levels above you before they actually get back to resurrecting you. Uh, so you will be behind the eight ball on that, but you can, can still help in those like setup situations that I was talking about using, you know, the the sort of like frost that freezes people in place to freeze someone in place while your friend fire tornadoes them so they can't move and just the tornado sits on top of them and beats them up. That kind of thing uh, is a lot of fun with this. So, yeah, I, I think overall Plunderstorm is, is I, I would say, genuinely a fun game mode. 
I just think because they attached, which I talked about at the top of the show, the rewards to such a lengthy process to get them all earned, they've shot themselves in the foot in a big way because they essentially are, are forcing players who do not enjoy the game mode to, if they want the rewards, have to go into the game mode. And so now you have people who are like, oh, I just want to get this out of the way. Let's just get these two games and let's just get this done inside a game with people who are going, yes, I really want to be here. Let's have some fun. Everyone else wants to be here, right, guys? Question mark? No, not really? Oh, okay, well, that's a problem. So yeah, that's uh, that's something that I, I think that they, they could work on of just helping these rewards along for everybody so that we filter out everyone who just is here for the rewards and everyone who's there to play the game mode and enjoy it is there to play the game mode and enjoy it. So hoping that uh, that, that happens sooner rather than later. The other thing I'm hoping for, because there's a really big tournament happening this coming weekend for Plunderstorm. They invited 60 streamers in um, from all over the place, although apparently they excluded some regions, which is kind of sad. I, I know that there's some people complaining that there's no Australian representation at this tournament, which is kind of surprising to me that they did not find an Australian streamer to participate in this. But um, they did find a Canadian. I know Ven Rookie's in it, so there's at least one Canadian in it. Uh, but uh, they're competing for $50,000 prize pool. Um, and they're all being paired up into teams and it's going to be happening this weekend and a lot of people are going to be checking it out. But, uh, that is, that has created a lot of, of hype around the game. And I think it would be absolutely reasonable for them to go, Hey, you know what? We found a way to make Plunderstorm free to play for the weekend. I think them to figure out a way to do that would dramatically help this game mode <laughs> because, while you're doing this big tournament with all these streamers who aren't just wow streamers these are like they've just invited in a ton of people who have big numbers to stream and, and do this sort of thing uh <laughs> it would be smart to allow their audiences to check it out and to check it out without having to spend 15 dollars or you know in my case like 24 dollars to get in and check out this thing for one weekend which is what they're going to be wanting to play it for right is, is playing alongside these people playing you know, before the games, potentially with their streamer friends, trying to queue against them, playing after those games, after they've lost and been kicked out with their streamer friends, trying to play against them. Like that kind of idea is what people are going to be into. And so having a weekend where, hey, let's open it up, let a whole bunch of people in, I think would make a lot of sense. And I think it's it would be a smart play if they chose to do that. So they haven't announced that yet, but I'm hoping that they move that direction quickly and are able to actually go, yes, this makes sense for publicity that we do this for this weekend. So I'm, I'm hoping that there's no technical thing that's binding them from doing it. Yeah, I, man, that would be great. I, I do think, you know, there is something weird about where this kind of sits. I mean, obviously BR battle Royale blew up. What about six, seven years ago, seven years ago, yeah, I seven say. Years ago. Yeah. you know, so you're, you're like seven years late to the party. And obviously the, the market is well, calcified right it's Fortnite, and then it's everybody else it seems like at this point and not like they're they're taking a shot at that but it's like to try to draw in a different audience right that's obviously part of what this is all about you know you have this thing that's relatively accessible low bar anybody get in and play right like you don't yep. have to have thousands of hours sunk into wow in order to play it no nope. but it's not free to play whereas like pretty much all these other games are um you know, you have to you have to sign up for the subscription to be able to access the client. It just sits in, in a really weird place. And I I mean, I feel like they had a cool idea and it was very experimental and they said, let's do it. And this is the way that we can do it right now. What I, I think like data mining suggests that this mode probably runs through April 30th. Yeah, um, I suspect that if, you know, if people continue to participate in it, that it'll be back in some fashion or some version of it will be back. And so maybe we'll see. Some differences there in terms of the sub requirement or whatever. I, I don't know. I mean, I I think doing stuff like this inside the game is cool and it gives them an opportunity to maybe, you know, flex some different muscles and try out some different stuff that would never really work in the main game. Or maybe it's some kind of tech that they can use that then opens up stuff more in in the, you know, the core game later on. And that stuff is always super valuable. Um I really don't like, I don't like BR games in general. Like I haven't enjoyed them historically and I don't really love the loop here, but I will say this, if you are like me and you're not really looking to become like a plunder Lord and live in <laughs> plunder storm for the next yeah. month, right? If all you want is the sweet, sweet pirate Mog, get in there and play like two games a day Get your big daily done that gives you 800 plunder. Yep. Okay. You do that every day. 
and I think a lot of the the advice you gave is like spot on. And if your goal is just to get your your renown filled up, you know, if you see other players, avoid them, right? Like yep, your you job is to get your quest done. Okay, yep. you you get a a random quest in every match that you queue into that gives you two hundred plunder. Mm-hmm. So that for when you, if when you have that daily up and and you do your match quest, that's a thousand plunder right there. And depending on where you drop, and I mean obviously there's RNG depending on where you end up, what's around you, who's around you, etc. Yeah. If you get like five hundred ish plunder collected during the game with your quest reward, like that's a pretty good haul for a couple minutes work. Mm-hmm. And if you do that a couple times a day, you'll max this event out in terms of the cosmetics for mainline WoW. In a few and then weeks. you can, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's not a huge time investment. Just try to have fun with it, I guess. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at. Like, I gotta kind of hype myself up. Like, all right, let's sit down, <laughs> let's log into Plunderstorm, get the yeah. games in for the day. But the biggest thing is, like, yes, other players are gonna kill you, but this is not a PvP mode. Like, there is PvP involved here, but if your goal is to collect the the renown rewards, the yeah, best you then, do is not fight. Yeah. Yes, no. you need to avoid other players. You need to find areas, low traffic areas. You need to kill as many creatures as you possibly can, as fast as you could possibly kill them. And you need to collect everything you see, all the plunder piles, all the chests, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, if you just go with that mindset, like, now I was playing some games before they did the change to that, I guess is actually the next thing in our notes is like yeah. uh, how, you know, the, they made they made some tweaks pretty quickly to how much plunder you actually earn. But, man, I got in there in some early games on Tuesday, I guess, and I was like, dude, this is going to take forever. I'm getting nothing. I'm getting no, like, that's it. I'm getting no plunder. I'm going to have to do 600 games in order to get all this stuff at the rate I'm going. Well, and all those games games would have to be at least seven to eight minutes long or 10 minutes long. Yeah. 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 And I'm also, like, at that point in time, also, I'm in this mindset of, like, I need to try to win the game. Yeah. So I am going to play like somewhat conservatively, but then in the mid to late game, I'm going to get very aggressive. Yeah. And that was not really working out in any way, shape or form. Yeah, you do get you do get a a nice bonus for winning, but it doesn't really like you basically get a, a decent rounds worth of extra plunder for coming in first. Right, so that risk reward is is not like you don't really need to be shooting for that every game. So, so if you have, the, the, what I want to hop in here just real quick and say, yeah, is uh, if you look at if if you're trying to min max this to actually just get your quest done as fast as possible and get in and get out, it's better that you get in, play for three to five minutes, die and queue again, than it is for you to try and go for the win because the amount of mobs that exist on the map after the five minute point is so dramatically low. It'll take you so long running around trying to find them to be able to kill them and avoid other players or trying to fight other players that you are just wasting time that you could be spending in a new game gathering plunder again. So for players who are like, hey, I just want to get this Renown thing done as fast as possible, what Jason's saying as far as just queue in, spend three to five minutes gathering as much as you can, get out, get in again, is actually the fastest way to complete the Renown. Which again, and, and this is what I, what I will say, is why they should have made these rewards something people could earn in five to six hours. Because it means that there's a lot of players doing what I just described you're supposed to do, because that is the fastest way to finish your renown with a lot of players who genuinely want to play the game mode, who are now going to get frustrated because they're getting into a lobby with 60 people, where 70% of those players are dead three to five minutes into the game because they just wanted out of the game to get into the next game. And you're not actually having the experience of what the game mode was designed to be because players aren't playing it the way it's designed to be played. They're playing it so they can get the rewards faster. So it's one of those like, hey, Blizzard did this to themselves, but I don't blame players for doing this because this is the best way for you to get your rewards and get out. I, I, mean, I don't think it's necessarily a problem, though, because the mode is called Plunder Storm, not Murder Storm. True, so you're there to true. collect all your plunder, right? Yep, and like, fair enough. Yeah, you do get a lot of plunder for, for player kills and stuff, um, especially if it's somebody who, you That's know, gathered you, a lot. Yeah. collected a bunch. Yeah. And you don't lose your stuff when, nope. when you get killed. Like, you, that's, you earned it permanently. But, yeah, um, and- you know, it, it does, they, did, they buffed that, and that does scale up over the course of the game. But your goal here is to grab as much 
pirate loot as you possibly can. And yeah, I, I think what you're saying, I agree with, and I've experienced that. And it, like it makes the loop kind of unsatisfying yes. because after two, three minutes, like I've got my five, 600 plunder yep. and I know that I'm not really going to get much more, no matter how much mm -hmm. more time I live. And like, I'm probably not going to win. I haven't, I don't have a win yet and I don't think I'm going to get one. Right. And it's like, Oh, if, if I do that, then I get 500 plunder, which I could have just gotten by standing in the storm and requeuing exactly. and going and getting 500 yep. more plunder. Yep. So, I think, like, in a way, it's actually good, like, but it, because it makes it accessible. Like, you can get these rewards. You sure. don't have to be good at this. Yep. You don't have to have some kind of skill at BR to get these rewards. You just have to understand the priority system, right? And you have to you have to understand, like, sort of what the – how the goals are set in front of you. Yeah. And then use that to your – use that knowledge to your advantage – Get what you can get and get out and get back in, get what you can get and get out. And then that renown bar is going to fill up. That's I mean, I mean, I think that that is like a positive overall. But, yeah, it does create this kind of stratification between people who are trying to compete with each other and people who are there just for the, you know, for the reward. Yeah. So I think that'll fall off probably pretty fast because I think we're a couple people weeks. will get this done and then yeah. stop queuing. Right. And so the only people queuing beyond a certain point will probably be renowned 40 years who are just trying to get wins or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, Which is so. why I'm advocating for, hey, they should just make the rewards renewable faster because we'll get to that yeah. point faster. Right. Like that's, that's what they all, should do. Is all I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad thing that people are doing this. I'm not saying it shouldn't be yeah. happening. I'm simply saying, hey, Blizzard created this situation and it's good that it's accessible for players. Like I, I definitely agree that this should be something that anyone who wants to put some time into to playing Plunderstorm and exploring it should be able to earn absolutely and i'm not suggesting at all you should have to win or be in the top 10 or top five yeah. to be able to earn enough stuff to be able to get like I, I think that's that would be ridiculous i i think it makes perfect sense that they did it this way i just think they made the renown too large of a bar it just needs to be a smaller bar yeah. that can be earned faster so that the people who want to get in and get their stuff can get in and get their stuff in a week or two and then get out and the people who want to actually play the game and enjoy the game mode and want to be there can play with other players who enjoy the game mode and want to be there, you know? Yeah, like, I don't really want to do this that much, you yeah. know? I'd be content to be done with this by now, and I'm only at 10, so... Yeah. Um, what they should do is there should be two separate lanes for you to queue into. One is, like, the sweaty, <laughs> I'm trying to win, right? And the other one is, like, I don't really want to fight, I'm just here for the plunder, right. you know? The, fr the friendly have, pirates. Yeah, have like, two <laughs> separate queues, and it's like, all right, we're just we're we're just picking up treasure piles here, guys. Everything's fine. Yep. Please yep. don't attack me. I, <laughs> I, I do wonder, though, and I, I think, uh, to kind of piggyback off your idea of, like, a free-to-play weekend or whatever mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. the, the streamer event... Um, I don't, I, I don't really see them doing that, but it would be cool. But what I'm hoping is that they introduce sort of like a double XP weekend or something, or, you know, maybe we see some kind of, uh, not double XP, but like double Renown. plunder, yeah, yeah, plunder. you know, yeah. like, yeah, like maybe like an end of match total plunder earned modifier bonus or something. Right. So it doesn't throw off the gameplay curve, but when you walk out with 500 plunder collected, you actually get a thousand rep. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. that would be really cool for like a weekend event around the, the stream event or maybe like the last week or two of the event, just to kind of pump it up and give people that chance to yeah. get those accelerated. Rewards. I, I hope they do some kind of modifier like that just to promote it. And so people can get more out of the, their time investment agreed no I, I think that would be another great idea as well those events happen so like the, the ideas that you're coming up with are ideas that exist inside of call of duty yeah and, all like these modern other, warfare like, like all these other games like they, them, yeah yeah like they they all do these sorts of double experience events and promotion events and i i know modern warfare does like free to play certain game modes events and like they do a bunch of things to sort of inspire players to get in check out the game during a period of time check out other game modes considering spending money on it after the fact once the free goes away if they really enjoyed it that's kind of the purpose behind it so yeah i think it'd be good for them to do promotion along those sorts of lines as well um we did stumble into some notes here so i'll, I'll cover those quickly the plunder drop from other players is significantly increased uh, as you mentioned i do want to mention and highlight when you die and all of your stuff sprays out all over the ground as jason said every time you pick up plunder it is banked away safely inside of your score for that match. So you aren't losing. No frustration is earned by 
being killed off inside of a game is you're not losing progression. It isn't an extraction game. Um, I really enjoy extraction shooters. That's one of my games that I enjoy. And in those games, you go in, you get stuff, and if you die in the game, you lose everything that you got, and you're just done, right? And you're like, oh, well, that is unfortunate. I lost all that stuff that I'd earned. That would make this game mode very frustrating. So I'm glad they chose Battle Royale, where you're banking away score the entire way. Because yes, you can get out there, gather as much as you possibly want. If someone happens to catch up and, and kill you, or you you know decide that, hey, there's not nothing around me anymore, I'm just going to walk into the storm and die off so I can start into the next queue, you've banked all the stuff that you've earned so far, so you're not worried about losing any of that. Um, they also doubled the plunder from golden chests. So golden chests are like the most common chests that you'll find lying around. They're kind of the gray item chest, if you will, uh, except they often don't drop an item, they just drop gold. And you can essentially crack them open. Like I said, target the goblets first, the piles with goblets in them first, but then grab the other stuff if you can. Uh, and they're just a really easy way to, to get a bunch of plunder and a bunch of experience. Um, plunder from non-player enemies was also increased by 50%. And the plunder for winning a match was increased from 100 to 500 plunder for winning a match. So when you win a match, uh, no big triumphant thing happens. There's just a pop-up in the middle of the screen that says, you won! And then on the ground, there's just a ton of plunder that sort of spills out everywhere because you get 500 plunder for doing it. Plus, you just killed someone who had earned a bunch of plunder through the entire match, so all their plunder spills all over the ground. Uh, typically, other players have also died inside the circle, so their plunder is all over the ground. There's just, like, a lot of very shinies inside the circle with you, and you run around and pick it all up and then leave. There was a bug happening early on where the moment you won, it kicked you out of the game. Um, so you weren't even able to pick up any plunder, and you essentially weren't sure if you won because you essentially killed someone, and then instantly we're back at the character select screen. <laughs> we're like, did I win? I don't know. Did I win? Uh, well, a way to tell is if you queue into a match after you won a match, you actually have a tabard on. It puts a tabard on your character to signify that you won your last match that you were in. So if you're running around inside a match, you see people wearing tabards. Those are people who have won previous matches. So it's kind of a neat little, you know, nod to prestige. And obviously... The first match after you win one is one where you tend to die in the first 30 seconds. And then, of course, you lose your tabard and you got to queue it again. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, it's uh, it's just the way the ball bounces as far as a lot of that stuff goes. But, yeah, they uh, they in general felt that a lot of rewards um, for Plunderstorm are super cool. And their team couldn't be more excited for people to sort of check them out and get them. So they're obviously buffing a lot of these things to help more players actually get them. And they're saying, keep the feedback coming. So I'm giving you more feedback. Please make the rewards even easier to earn and faster to earn so that... The players who don't like the game mode spend less time in it. And the players who do like the game mode will just continue to like the game mode. Like, there's not really hurting anybody. So let's just get that one done. I think that's easy feedback to give out there. Um, all right. As far as the... Uh, first, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. Also, first two uh, forum posts from Kirby Gold, who is uh, Orlando. Oh, yeah. Uh, who was in the uh, videos and stuff. And uh, I know him a bit from Twitter and stuff. He's super huge to a WoW fanboy who... Uh, uh, he's been working there for quite a few years now, and he came over um, doing server engineering stuff on the Classic team, and now he's doing all kinds of experimental stuff like this. So that's awesome to see. Um, and yeah, I mean, I you know whatever my personal feelings are about the mode, I I think you have to consider it a success after just like a week, right? Like obviously, a lot of people really like it, which is cool. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about it and people sharing clips and you know whatever it is that people do with their their br stuff they've been doing that and that's cool um and i mean for the most part it looks and works pretty well and i do i do love what you mentioned about uh dragging stuff around the ui that feels really good i, I like that element of being able to just like swap the buttons you know the hotkeys and stuff is on like or pick it up and you know move it around like that's it, it's they tried to make it as streamlined as possible. You know, there's like no add-ons and, and no, nothing like that. I mean, it does create maybe some accessibility issues. And, um, you know, I, I guess the problem is how do you, how do you decide which add-ons are for accessibility and which are for, well, you know, gameplay optimization or whatever. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I would like to see maybe a future iteration of this kind of resolve some of those issues or add more options for people to, set up the ui in a way that is more accessible to them if add-ons aren't going to be on the table um yeah, yeah there's there's, well, a, there's, there's a lot of improvements as far as that that i can go into for sure the the largest of which that restricting add-ons affects is people who would like to use controllers this is a game mode that is essentially designed to use a controller because it's only five abilities that you can use at any given point 
and you just run around the map and there's you know you, you may, there's a melee attack which is your sixth ability that you can use is a baseline melee uh, so not having add-on support inside World of Warcraft makes using a controller substantially more difficult to do. Uh, so I, I think that that would be a good one to include because controller support for this mode would be, I think, something that people would get very excited about and actually use in a big way. So that's a big one. Um, you cannot move your character frames uh, or your teammate's character frame or your target's character frame. Moving character frames is a big deal. It, it just makes it easier for a lot of people to see what's going on on their screen and organize their screen better. And I don't see how that creates some sort of corruption in some way. So yeah, let people move their character screen around. Let people rebind the uh, melee key to their right-click mouse button. Um, please God, let people do this or their left-click mouse button. Either of the two. Uh, right now, you have to bind it to a key on your keyboard to be able to melee. Um, mine is on Q at the moment, which means I cannot uh, strafe left while I'm using my melee attack. I can only strafe right because I don't have enough fingers on that side of my hand to do that properly. Um, but I needed finding a place to put that melee attack when literally my mouse is just sitting here and I would love to be able to left click and melee attack while I'm holding down right click to turn my character and I'm using arrow keys to move around and pressing buttons on my keyboard to be able to cast abilities. Uh, would just make a lot of sense. So I, I would love if they move that melee attack to either, you know, left mouse or allow you to at least to bind it there. Because uh, right now the keybinds restrict that. And I don't know why. I did hear a story about the fact that during testing and some of the testing videos they showed, someone had actually done this because they created a macro to make this happen inside of their own dev test team. Um, so uh, just please, that would be great. Let's, let's just let everyone do that because that would just make a lot more sense um so that's another one uh as far as um the resurrection ui i think a progressive timer on resurrecting someone would be better that you actually earn progression towards as opposed to you have to stand there for 15 seconds otherwise you start over and have to stand there for 15 seconds um i think it would be a lot more fun for players if they could stand on it for two or three seconds, like make it take a second to get going. That's fine. Make it take a second to get going so people can't just run back and forth over top of the corpse and just like slowly move it along. They actually have to like stand in it for a second. Then it starts progressing. Um, I think would make a lot more sense for this because more often than not, there'd be a lot more cheeky reses that can kind of happen that I think would be a lot of fun and make the game mode more enjoyable. So that would be nice. This is something that games like Call of Duty and whatnot have is the progressive res. Uh, where it saves the progression and you can go back to it and go back to it and go back to it until you finally finish it. Um, I think, I think that would be good. Uh, I, I, there's a, there's a lot of, of little things that I think just would make the game a lot more fun. There's a double jump in the game. People who don't know, you can press your space bar twice and jump once and then jump again. And there's abilities that this teams up with. There's a gnomish launcher that launches your character around as a tool, which is really fun that you can keep jumping inside of. So you can run over it jump to launch yourself into the air and then jump again in the air and keep bouncing yourself around in the air until you land somewhere. And there's been some pretty hilarious things that have happened in final circles where someone's used one and just gone in a circle with jumps and just landed and popped on it again and gone in a circle and jumps and landed on hopped again and gone in a circle and jumps. And I hope we see some of the silliness happen this weekend like that uh, with some of the streams that are taking place. But it, it's fun to uh, to see what people are sort of figuring out with some of these abilities I just wish that a lot more of it was was customizable to players and intuitive to players. Um, my number one tip to everyone is immediately rebind your A and your D to strafe right and strafe left. Having A and D on turn right and turn left is useless. Immediately rebind those keys to strafe le right and strafe left and you will make your life and your gameplay substantially better in this uh, game mode. So yeah, like that's the first thing you should do when you get into a match for the first time is be like, I'm just gonna, or you're inside the lobby for 30 seconds. I'm just gonna rebind A and D to strafe, light, right, strafe right and strafe left as opposed to leaving them on turn right and turn left because you're, you're just, you will enjoy life so much more when you're actually doing that. So yeah, it's another tip that I'd wanna throw in there for sure for players to check out. But overall, I, I, I think it's a fun game mode. I think it's more fun with friends. I personally, if I could choose to, um, I understand why there's a solo queue because it allows everyone to sort of just queue in at their own time and do it. I would probably never play this game mode solo personally. I'd probably only play it with a friend because I think it's just substantially more fun and the opportunity to resurrect a friend 
makes the game life longer and more intense and more interesting to uh to see how that goes so um i i i personally would just play duos all the time if i was going to play this game mode at all uh but yeah jason is there anything else you want to mention before we hop into the content update i guess to sort of go over some of this stuff i don't think so i mean that's you know it's it's a very interesting uh, experiment, you know. It's not really to my personal taste, but I guess you know we'll see how it plays out. I'm sure we're going to get more fixes and updates to it over the course of, you know, the event's lifespan, and so that'll be interesting to see what where they decide to go with it, and you know, hopefully we get some kind of little bonus events or something, little bonus weekends as, as it rolls along. That's that's my big thing. I'd like to really maximize my time in my in my couple games a day there. Yeah. All right. So. We dove in, I didn't dive in, but we got this big post from Blizzard that dives into changes coming up for season four. All right. So we have a developer's note where they basically said, hey, we've increased the power of all the set bonuses. They're going to be returning in season four. So they actually match up with the rest of the gear and what's going to be happening at that level. So they've confirmed, hey, we're fixing those with set bonuses. They released a slew of those changes. So if you're curious what happened with, you know, Balanced Druid, we now know that Vault of the Incarnates, set two set bonus, Star Surge and Starfall, increase the damage of your next Wrath and Starfire by 30%, stacking up to three times. And uh, that that is um, was 20%, now 30%. So they did 10% buff to that. And then Vault of the Incarnates, four set bonus. When you enter Eclipse, your next Star Surge or Starfall costs 15 less star power. And it was five less star power. So they've tripled that and deals 40% more damage as opposed to 20% more damage. So they just basically said, hey, this is how we tweaked everything. So if you're curious how your set bonuses have changed or what your set bonuses is, if you actually didn't go and look at who won what as far as those go, personally, this wasn't my choice for Balanced Druid. I like the current set that we're in that reduces my cast times on everything because it just feels a lot more fun to have more haste. That's just me. Now, I might not notice that because I might have so much haste with all the extra gear that we're getting <laughs> that I might just feel that way anyway. So I don't really know. But... Uh, I I do find that uh, that this wasn't the one I was particularly excited about for them bringing back for balance. So I guess balanced druids who were rating substantially more often than me were the ones who voted and they got the win, uh, which is probably where I would have been voting if I were rating all the time. So I don't blame them for doing so. Um, <laughs> we also got yeah. Probably what uh, happened was uh, the Discord said, "Hey, vote for this one, please," and yes. then everybody did that. And that's, yeah, that's usually how that goes. That's usually but, how it goes. Yeah. Um, I mean, hey, they said that they were going to retune the bonuses yep. ahead of season four for the older sets to bring them up to you know uh, season the season four power level, and so they did that. They did it already. I don't think it's probably worth going back and digging out your old sets. Uh, you no. know. 70 item levels at a date or whatever um but yeah, see if we also mind. if we voted for the current one we would have been stronger right now <laughs> right maybe well maybe not maybe they don't rebalance that i don't know I don't but know. um yeah i mean you know season four is we don't have a date but it is coming and it's going to be on this data right so uh these changes are in as a result you know the, these itemization changes are in so that when they push the button on season four You'll be able to go get your season four sets. And then, you know, is that going to be the end of tuning for season four? Probably not. But at least it's a good place to start from, right? Just bumping these up a little bit to give, you know, give them a little bit of, of, a, of a little a little shine on them, you know, mm -hmm. coming into the new season. So that is that's why they did that. Yeah. Uh, they also went through and did some hot fixes to Ulduar time walking, including... Uh, one thing in here for follower dungeons, which I thought, which I thought was really cool. Um, if a player in a follower dungeon uses Bloodlust, Heroism, Time Warp, Fury of the Aspects, then the followers will no longer try and cast their version when they think it's appropriate. They're going to wait for the player to cast theirs and the player decides it. So if you want to be the one who decides when Bloodlust, Heroism, Time Warp, Fury of the Aspects is happening, then you just cast the first one and it just dictates from there on. The moment you cast it a single time... It, they'll just let you dictate going forward, which I think is a really cool way to let these things work. So I love that change and that that change came in. But then, yeah, they also went into Ulduar and, and fixed a whole bunch of stuff. Um, they fixed Mimron would no longer jump the gun too quickly and attack players while remaining untargetable. Uh, yeah, it's nice when you can actually fight a boss and the boss is just beating you up when you can't do anything about it. Um, so that was one of the things they fixed. 
And also a fiction issue where various boss enemies were moving great distances when tanks were too close. So in other words, a tank would get too close to the boss, the boss would like run 20 miles away. And you'd be like, why did the boss just run away from me that far? This is a really irritating thing for a tank because then the tank moves close to it again and then it runs away again and then it just keeps repeating. So that's something they fixed. And then they also fixed an issue where Yogg-Saron's tentacles could spawn within the boss's model, uh, which makes it really hard to target and kill them. Just putting that out there. Unless you're using a slash target macro, you are probably not even going to know that they exist until you just suddenly die to a tentacle and go, where did that laser beam come from? And it's like, oh, it came from inside of Yogg. So yeah, that's a, that's a fun one. Uh, yeah, Olduar was pretty busted. And yeah. um, like even the vehicle boss, like they, they made a bunch of fixes to that because it was just a mess. Like I remember when... Last time we did it was not that long ago. It was probably with these bugs present because we walked in there to Flame Leviathan and it was like, why is half the raid dead and none of our buttons are working? Well, right. th this is why, because people were getting hit by burning tar that wasn't actually there or, you know, uh, liquid pyrite wasn't doing anything. So people would run out of ammo and then that would just be that. So that's good. Old War is not my favorite time walking experience. Um you know, it being this buggy is, is certainly th didn't help. So that's really good. I want to backtrack just for a second sure. for some of these class changes because they did something really weird uh, last week, which is they snuck in like a mini Holy Priest rework. It's not like a huge redesign from some of the stuff we've seen, but like they moved a lot of stuff around Holy Priest. Um, and even like Mistweaver got a couple new talents and stuff. That is bold to drop that into a patch that had like no PTR, right? Right. Like this is not how we are used to operating. Um, I think like so far what I've mostly seen is that holy players don't, you know, they didn't quite know what to make of this at first, but it seems like it has been, I, I know at least one holy main who, who was pretty pleased with their, I mean, they got Ray a seven percent increase stuff. to their healing straight across the board. Like they just got a seven. No, they got a, re they got a, reduc they got a reduction of seven percent across the board. Was it but then all of these other? Yeah. Oh yeah, reduced all, man. All right. All of the all of these other. It's you know it's because they've they've added all these other reworks to the tree and these talent redesigns and all this stuff. Right. So that's a lot to chew on, man. With no PTR. I'm, I was just surprised that they did that. I I don't know. The overall feedback to it seems to be not horrendous like people aren't you know screaming from the mountaintops that like blizzard how could you do this to us um and yeah like i said one one of my holy priest friends was rather pleased with their you know their raid results uh after these changes but it is you know there's an adjustment when you have this much stuff changing inside a spec that you've been playing for a while now in this expansion so i was i was surprised i like i the the tier set tuning and stuff like we knew they were going to do that so it makes sense they would do it with this patch but i mean yeah like monk got a little bit you know i mean um, new talents in a patch with no ptr alone is pretty weird but then you know holy priest really got touched up so well um, they, they snuck some secret tech into holy priest i noticed leap of faith no longer interrupts spells cast from the ally it was used on mm -hmm. so like I feel like there's some sneaky world first raider, world first PvP or business that can happen with this, with people inside a PvP match getting a long cast going and being yoinked away from melee that are trying to catch them and being able to finish the cast that they were doing because it didn't interrupt the cast that they were doing anymore. And similarly with world first raid stuff, where right. there could be some secret tech used with Leap of Faith now where people are channeling things or casting things and not being interrupted when they're moved around. Well, you know, the big problem now is every mage is going to stand and stuff and then blame the Holy Priest. that they can get pulled not... out of it. Yep. Yeah. It's yep. Like, Listen, I, I had to finish my cast because yep. I got to maintain my uptime. You could have pulled me out of it. To, yeah. yeah, you're supposed to leap of faith me out of that. Like, yeah. It's not my fault for standing in that circle of exactly. death. Exactly. It's yours for not... You're supposed to be the healer. Like, yeah. you know... Why should I'm I have dead, to use my hello? legs? Yeah. Right. I needed to finish that pyroblast or right. whatever. I don't, yeah. I don't know how to play mage, but it, I assume <laughs> that, it, that it results that, it you know, you're doing a lot of standing there waiting for spells to finish casting. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, uh, come on, holy priest, or I guess any kind of priest that have, I don't know which specs have access to Leap of Faith, but y yoink your, your mages out of there. Let them finish yeah. their cast. Okay. Actually, don't do that. Don't do that. Make them suffer. Make them do mechanics. <laughs> this, I, is, I would, this is the raid leader speaking. Yeah, I would, I would love if they actually did. Um, all right, so we're almost at the subscription numbers here, guys. There's just a few more hot fixes we're going to go through. Uh, the raid loot from Vault of the Incarnates and Abaris and Shadow Crucible have received several adjustments to align with the changes made to Amirdasil. 
uh, the Dream's Hope, where a class set token items will now drop at a one to three relative ratio to non-token items, and all very rare items have a separate chance to drop in an additional boss's standard quantity of loot. So we're more likely to see essentially all of those rare pieces drop, and we're more likely to see, we're less likely to see class tokens show up inside of the vault. So just keep that in mind. Uh, also, there's a developer's note here as they look ahead to season four, they're aiming to level the playing field for certain underperforming raid trinkets. So we're gonna be doing a bunch of raid trinket tuning that's gonna be taking, that's taking place. So if you're someone who uses one of those raid trinkets and you're really curious about what changed, check out the patch notes because they went through the Conjured Chill Globe, the Ward of the Faceless, uh, all stacks on the Enduring Dread Plates Hellsteel Plating, um, the Omnius Chromatic Essence and the Blossom of Myrdasil, as well as the Firax Tainted Rage Heart and tweaked them all. So they all got some tuning to keep them a little bit more relevant and more accurate as to where they should be, as well as the uh, trinkets for the Tomb of the Unstable, uh, Umbral Skulls, Fractured Heart, Globe of Jagged Ice, Water's Beating Heart, Granite's Enduring Scale, and Inexorable Resonator also got reworked in as far as dungeon trinkets go. And then they tr did even more reworks. So like they've, they've sort of cleaning stuff up for season four. So expect season four to go live without any problems is what I'm sort of reading with this. There'll be zero issue. Everything will be it's tuned perfectly right. balanced. Yeah, it's going to be it's perfect. All perfect balance. Um, yeah. I will say these yeah. are the most aggressive changes we've seen to classes, as you said, adding talents, doing that sort of stuff, while at the same time tuning all these sorts of dungeons and old <laughs> trinkets and stuff ahead of right. a season starting. So, right. Who knows? No PTR. Yep. Yeah. We're just we're in uncharted waters here a bit. Um, yep. I mean, it, this kind of makes sense. Like, man, those, um, the Dragonflight dungeon trinkets are, are kind of moldy, I feel like. Um, now, granted, it's probably not worth going back and getting Mythic Zero versions of them. Um, so, you know, that'll, that's season four loot for sure. Um, it's kind of a bummer that they, they nerfed some, I mean, they nerfed the Tainted Rage Heart a bit. Like, they, it, Increase the absorb by five percent, but let's be honest, it's not really why we're using it. It was a nice absorb either way. We're using it for mm. all the extra damage for free while we were absorbing stuff, and they nerfed that kind of significantly. Like the the passive AOE, they cut down by twenty percent, which is a fair nerf. I mean, it's still a great trinket. Um, I think this specifically means that like tanks still want this trinket, but non tanks probably don't really care. Like this is probably not competitive for most damage focused specs. Which I guess is fine. Like, it is a little awkward to have a tank trinket be a very good DPS option. Uh, but we also live in a world where tank trinkets are pretty much useless beyond a certain point in the season, and tanks are really just trying to tack on more damage. So, I don't know. I, I wonder if we'll see, like, a philosophy shift in the way some of those get designed in the future. But it, it was just, you know, it's kind of a bummer for a thing that you use every single time you play the game. And, you know, it's not a new season or anything. I, I don't have nothing to replace this with, right? Like, I'm... I'm still using it in the season where I got it and it's just not as good as it used to be. So yeah, it's kind of a bummer, but not, you know, it's not really world altering at this point. It's like, I'm not going to hit some kind of progression goal because they chopped down the damage on my field trinket. Yeah. Another fix that came in is the battleground blitz brawl that was taking place. They went into this and decided that, Hey, you know what? It'd be more fun for this brawl. If players who weren't tanks got to carry the flag and didn't just die immediately. So they've actually added in a buff that makes people take reduced damage if they're not in a tank spec and they're carrying the flag called Empowered Carrier. Uh, so that way there's it's more diversity of who can carry the flag and people can carry the flag longer. Uh, they also um, had increased the mount speed for everyone inside of these Battle Realm Blitz Brawls to 150%, but they're actually backing that off a little bit because it was a little too high for people zipping around the map at 150% increased mount speed from what they normally are at. So yeah, that's got scaled back a little bit. They're still reworking the brawl, but they're happy with people's feedback so far and let people know to continue providing it. So I didn't get a chance to check out this brawl. So I, I'll be curious to try it once it's in its next form, next time it's around and yeah. I can actually dive in and see it. This is like your solo shuffle brawl, but yeah. for rated BGs, right? Um, yeah. So I guess the, the cool thing here is that the, uh, the main purpose was that the tank, quote unquote, Battlegrounds, Warsong Gulch and, and Twin Peaks. Yeah. Um, they weren't showing up as much because people aren't queuing his tank into this yeah. into battle, battleground blitz. So this way you don't need a tank and then you can still end up on one of these two maps and whoever, you know, is carrying the flag, the flag the is effectively the tank for the duration of the flag yeah. carry. And, you know, it, you can still queue in as a tank and you will be matched in a game with a team that has a tank 
but it won't be like there's a tank spec player on one side and not on the other, and then it's compensated for yeah. with this empowered carrier buff. So just a little housekeeping, and I think that's probably healthier overall for the population and for the queue, for the variety of maps and whatever. I mean, they have those maps in the rotation for a reason, right? Like they want to have the variety in the pool. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty understandable why somebody wouldn't want to queue into uh, battleground blitz as a tank. And then you're probably only getting those two maps, right? So it sort of creates the inverse problem too. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's just a change that makes sense, right? For, for this kind of idea of we're going to have queuable rated battlegrounds. Yeah. Why not? I, I don't, I, I mean, I don't know what the overall, reaction from the pvp community has been like i don't really live in that world so i don't know but i mean to me it just makes sense it's it's yeah. you know it's, it's just a quality of life upgrade for people in those queues yeah the uh the one thing that i feel that they 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 buffed and changed in these hotfix notes that i wanted to highlight from eye of the storm was that they have now added a hidden effect that prevents fall damage for both teams at the start of the match when you actually ride in because everyone rides off of a high point and they often just drop into something. And if you don't have slow fall or someone casting some sort of slow fall ability on you, you just kind of run in and fall and take a bunch of damage and then go running into the other team. So yeah, they finally added that in. I think a lot of PVPers would be very happy that they finally made it so that at the start of the match, you aren't, don't have to be really careful about how you drop down. You can just commit to a line and get into the fight and not worry about losing half of your health because you fell at the start of the match you have to stop and heal yourself up before you engage in a fight so yes that's a, a very good change that they threw in there as well okay let's dig into subscriber number stuff all right so gdc was uh this past weekend and there was a lot of announcements that came out at this event um that were under wraps and typically aren't things that are released to the public for a certain period of time afterwards when the company decides, hey, this is, you know, what we're doing with this. Now, someone got Bellular, a whole bunch of these screenshots of slides that were shown during the Blizzard presentation. Other people were probably there too, and whatever that was, but he put out a video, and this video sort of encompassed and talked about what these slides sort of meant. Um, these slides talked about the success and failures of Shadowlands, um, primarily the failures of it. It talked about uh, sort of the past 30 years of Warcraft in general, but the thing that a lot of WoW players were super interested in and raised a lot of eyebrows was there was a graph that showed the subscription numbers for World of Warcraft without a, a, an actual number bar and axis on that. They just had the years that things had taken place and expansions had come out and what Bellular did is took the last number that we knew, which was that there was 5.5 million subscribers during Legion at one point, and knew that that was the lowest point during Legion and was able to extrapolate that based off of comments like, hey, our numbers doubled that Blizzard had said during the Classic WoW launch and that numbers had done this at different times. So basically use the formula of that to extrapolate out sub numbers. All right. So the numbers that everyone's sharing around the internet everywhere are not actual numbers. They are based off of a math problem that Bellular did um, to sort of calculate it, which means that they are based off of something factual and are probably give or take a certain amount accurate to what's going on with this. Based off of those numbers, uh, we could say that there's around 7.25 million subscribers currently playing a World of Warcraft product. And what I mean by that is during these graphs that we were looking at, we saw where numbers were for Legion, for Shadowlands, for when Classic launched, for, you know, et cetera, et cetera, up until current now where we have Plunderstorm going on right now, as far as those subscriber numbers go. So the important factor is these are people who are subscribed to World of Warcraft in general. They're enjoying a World of Warcraft product at the current time right now. We have no idea who's how many subs are playing the live game, how many subs are playing whatever. They're all playing World of Warcraft. It doesn't really matter. It's how many subs they currently have. Uh, but we do also know from this that subscriber numbers drop to their lowest point ever during Shadowlands, which is also not too surprising. 
uh, which was, I think, around 4.3 million or 4.2 million, uh, I think is what they sort of estimated somewhere in that range to 4.5 million is, is where subscribers numbers drop to, which if you consider that numbers were at 7 million and dropped down to that, they lost like half their subscriber base going into um, Shadowlands and during Shadowlands. So that spoke to a lot of um, the issues that we were sort of seeing with the game. Uh, and that's uh, that's a, a really, really, I guess, impactful thing about that. So that's why they put up a slide that said, hey, what were the failures of Shadowlands? Um, they list in the story and setting category, the afterlife setting wasn't accessible, the new antagonist wasn't developed very well, and the well-known story heroes were not, were, sorry, were diminished. So they didn't really do much with the well-known story heroes and they kind of diminished them and, and made them not as important and as, as I guess, key a, a role in the story. Didn't do a lot with, didn't do enough with them. Didn't make them cool enough, if you will, in it. So that was the story elements. The gameplay elements, systems didn't evolve with player expectations. The borrowed power that existed was something that continued to be a problem and not enough variety as far as the actual gameplay throughout the expansion goes. And as far as community goes, there were gaps in content. There was a lack of transparency from the company as to what was going on and players didn't feel heard, which I think in community for me is where the most things resonate true. Uh, yes, I don't think the antagonist was developed very well during Shadowlands. Yes, I think the afterlife wasn't something that a lot of people wanted to do and also wasn't very accessible because players were, were were kind of coming into the game and going, what even is this? Because um, it wasn't very Dungeons and Dragons-y kind of situation for folks who had never experienced World of Warcraft before. It's a confusing expansion to enter. Um, and I, I don't know if I agree necessarily that all the well-known story heroes were diminished, but they certainly raised up others and kind of just diminished some. So that didn't bother me as much, but the gaps in content is something that a lot of expansions suffer with. I kind of set that aside. The lack of transparency was huge. In a lot of ways, the community was giving tons of feedback and weren't feeling heard. And the team was being totally non-transparent about what their decisions were and why they were making them. And it wasn't until like far later in the expansion, almost the last patch of the expansion, that we started to see that reverse. The team started to be way more open and transparent about things and everything started to change based off player feedback and the whole expansion started to get better, um, which I think is also shown in sub numbers as we head into Dragonflight and that starts to creep back up again. Um, and then obviously with Dragonflight launch, it spiked back up by a few million subscribers, which is good to see because it means that, you know, essentially we're in a healthy upswing on subscribers at the moment. We're probably tabling off right now as we get towards the next expansion, but there's a chance that that number for War Within is an even higher subscription number based off of the growth that we saw during Shadowlands. And by Shadowlands, I mean this era of World of Warcraft with Classic and Plunderstorm and, you know, Cataclysm Classic coming out and SOD taking place and like all these different modes of and, and parts of World of Warcraft taking place. So uh, it's, it's a really neat graph to look at. It's information we have not had um, and we have not heard anything from World of Warcraft since Warlords of Draenor uh, was the last time that we really got numbers because they stopped announcing them during Warlords. Um, so yeah, it's it's good to finally get a piece of the info. Um, overall, I think this was a great discussion and I really look forward to seeing what Blizzard puts forward with this sort of information because we know that there's probably some sort of workup that's going to be released from Blizzard in the next few weeks that basically covers all of this information. Uh, from their side, as opposed to interpreted by other people sort of viewing the slides and, and extrapolating and figure, figuring things out. So I'm hoping they actually just slap sub numbers onto this thing since people have sort of figured out a math equation to give us a general idea. Just give us the actual graph with the numbers. Like, that'd be just, you know, that'd be cool to see at this point. It would be. Yeah. I mean, it's usually it's only a good idea to do that when you have good news, um, which, you know, I, I guess they kind of do at the moment. Um Look, I their, wish their, that, their game has 7.25 million subscribers or somewhere in that ballpark, right? Yeah. That's subscribers who are paying at least $15 a month in my area, know, substantially more, of, right? Of $15 USD, yeah. Yeah, so like, oh. it, it's not the equivalent. It's higher in other, like my region, it's it's more expensive for me to play World of Warcraft than it is for you. And that's not right. because of exchange rate. That's because my region is charged more money. Australia is also charged more money. They pay more than $15 yeah. a month to play the game. Uh, as far as that that exchange rate would go with U.S. dollars, 
for whatever reason, Blizzard just continued to increase the price in other regions and just never touched the U.S., which seemed really weird to me, but it's what they chose to do. So, yeah, it's uh, it, that's a lot of money. If you just think about it, 7.25 million, that's subscribers. <laughs> that's a lot of money. Yeah. So the game's in a really healthy place, which I think is the important thing to recognize. The yeah, franchises. I mean, I, I would really like it if uh, the whole talk from GDC would get released. Um, I was reading... Uh, Google translated version of it on Inven, which is oh. a Korean site. Yeah. Um, and it was like legible, right? Like I could figure out what was being expressed, but it's not very elegant, right? Like it's yeah. not a human like running this from, you know, uh, what John's saying in English into Korean and then back into English. It's yeah. the, you know, it, it's, it's the machine doing it. Um, but I could I could still get like a feel for what he was talking about, and um, I would love to see the whole thing and hear it out of the horse's mouth. It seemed like a pretty interesting presentation. Yeah. Um, and I, the, you know the slides from it that were that were released, I, I think were pretty cool to look at. I, I, what I what I like is, you know, John's John's an industry veteran, right? He wasn't old school Blizzard. Uh, he came over during uh, Miss of Pandaria development, and he worked on on Pandaria, and he worked on. Um, Reaper of Souls, and then he came back to WoW after that. And he was at like Sony. He worked on the God of War franchise and stuff like that uh, years before. So the guy, the guy is a he's an industry vet, and uh, he's obviously uh, you know a big WoW nerd. You get the sense when he's whenever he's on stage or you know anything that he that he puts forward. Like he really does. He I think he's he's a good. He seems like a good boss for for Warcraft to me. And I thought it was really interesting that he like he kind of publicly leveled such pointed criticism at Shadowlands specifically you know to see the boss of of the franchise acknowledge that i think is something we've never really seen before not in this way to just straight up say like yeah the afterlife setting for Shadowlands was just wrong it wasn't what players wanted it certainly wasn't what i wanted so it was great to hear him say that right or or at least to read a, a description of him saying that I, I didn't i haven't heard it um you know i i think sort of the the pointed criticisms of Shadowlands were mostly right uh i think part of the issue like you know he he framed it as lack of transparency during Shadowlands but i don't think it was that so much as it was like stubbornness, man. Like they were responding it to feedback. That way, like, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, we think it's yeah. going to be fine. We think you're going to like it. Just play it. And yeah. we didn't like it. You know, I, I, not that I think that players should be developing the game, but I think there should be a little bit more give and take with a living, you know, breathing kind of service game. Like, wow. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, I think um, the other thing that really jumped out at me, looking at the subscriber curve, you know, obviously there was that huge spike when, um, classic came out in 19 but it leveled off like basically right exactly to where bfa was at yep not long after like that was a, that was a very brief it was window that year. In time. it was like within three months yeah 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 it was it was it was a real it was a real quick spike but you know that having that extra product and that extra value in a subscription i think probably undergirded shadowlands quite a bit i mean that drop off in uh in 21 22 was like severe yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's kind of startling to look at i mean i guess like bfa was on kind of a similar trajectory but there was no classic at that time until the second year of bfa right so i mean even in even in legion our beloved legion like you see obviously at the end of an expansion you have fewer players right it's, they they expect that and they know that but shadowlands was trending you know pretty pretty badly and i think Having classic in the ecosystem and as a uh, as a, a value addition to the subscription, probably like really bailed them out in terms of having like the you know the the revenue to continue developing the game. Yeah, I do think like one other thing that jumps out at me too is like, uh, I mean, we have to assume that this is official since the, it came from like John yeah. Hyde is standing in front of John. the assembly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, like yeah. I mean, if you lo look at the curve for like. Burning Crusade and Wrath Lich King Classic expansion launches so, like that. Th this is the this is the other thing, right? We got three graphs, right? We have the first one, which is hey, this is what we predicted to happen after Shadowlands. Then we got the hey, which this was is what optimistic. this is what actually happened after Shadowlands, and then we got the hey, this is where you know we are today, right? I thought what they predicted to happen with Shadowlands was 
actually, like you, you said, fairly optimistic. I, I think it actually, I would have guessed it, it to table off better, but no, you're right. Like, I think this was actually a fairly optimistic curve for what they were expecting to have happen. And to look at, like, they probably lost another, well, you can figure it out because if they draw that five million, they probably lost a million more subscribers than they thought they were going to lose. Um, at least, yeah. From that. And that was a big drop. And then their gain from Dragonflight was nowhere near where they expected it to be. Uh, but fortunately right. we are on the right track to actually recovering that currently with, with where things are at. But yeah, yeah. I, well, I think, I mean, like looking at it, they either thought that Shadowlands was going to hold up better than Legion. Yeah. Which I, yeah. I would consider it optimistic or they thought that burning crusade and wrath classic would undergird the subs a lot more than maybe they realistically right. did. Um, Cause they, they didn't really create a blip at all. Yeah, it's yeah. It, that which is really weird to me, uh, especially since you know um, the classic team is chugging along with Cataclysm, which now, I think a lot of people are really not excited about. But that's a whole other conversation. I mean, I'll, I'll anyway. Use, I, oh, okay, I'm I was going to say I'll use personal experience um, for this, which is a lot of my raid team stopped playing live game and went to play classic stuff, and then came back from classic stuff and played live game. And if that says anything, even if thirty percent of players were doing that then you that's why you didn't see those numbers move, right? Because if you have this transitional moving back and forth, you have people leaving the game for Shadowlands and people coming into the game to play classic stuff, as well as people who are currently playing Shadowlands, just switching which product they're playing. So that that could right. affect that as well. Yeah, I, I guess I, I guess the thing is like those releases didn't really draw people back in, you know, and, and it, it probably is a, is a retention tool more than anything because it gives you another option. You know, you're paying your money and there's all these, these different, uh, these different things you can hang out in. You can go play these other clients. You can go play classic area. You can go play, you know, uh, one of the, exp whatever expansion is live, you can go play hardcore, you can go play SOD. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, looking at the early 2024 curve and, now, granted, we have a lot of options in the subscription, but now the curve is higher than it was at Dragonflight launch. Yeah, like that's I, that's pretty surprising it's to me. It's a surprising and thing this laid into a live products sort of release. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Not, like that is not how it has usually worked since about yeah. 2011, tw 2010, maybe. So yeah. I think it's a it's a really good sign. I mean, the game has felt healthy, even though obviously it's been a slow couple of months in Dragonflight land, just because it, we've been in this weird limbo and. You know, I think season four is going to be a bit more muted as well, but that's fine. I mean, I think that's fine, too. Like, I think a lot of players don't really want to engage with the game a lot and dump a lot of time in over the summer. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think they have, you know, John or whoever made the slides for John titled it, we reestablished a relationship with our players. And I think to a certain degree that that's really true. Now, you know, in this in this world, in, in this in this genre, it's all about what have you done for me lately, right? So if the War Within lands flat, we're not going to go, oh, well, yeah, but everything else has been so good for the last two years. Like, it's fine. We're just going to keep going. Like, that's not what players are going to do. So they have now, I think, really reestablished the franchise, you know, and really uh, brought the game back from, uh, you know, maybe not the brink of, of death, but the brink of apathy right like yeah. people just not really caring about what they're doing or what they're playing and they're just kind of playing out of habit maybe the question is you know can they sustain this goodwill from from dragonflight and from classic and from some of the more experimental stuff they've been doing and you know continue to i, I think a big challenge for the game is going to be finding a new generation of players really wow it's an old game though us you know those of us who started back in the day we're pretty crusty vets at this point you know, and um, our, many of us have different life priorities than we had when we started playing World of yeah. Warcraft. And um, you do need to appeal to a new generation of players. And I, I do play with, with, with some people who are newer to the game and are a lot uh, younger than I am, which is cool. So hopefully that will, uh, you know, that hopefully they'll, it'll catch on. I think doing some of the more experimental and lower bar to entry stuff certainly helps with that. And once you have people subbed and then they have all these different options in the client, you know, maybe they check something out. So... I think, um, you know, War Within really has to land square. It has to be really fun out, out of the gate. 11.0 just has to be a, a slam dunk, and then we can we can keep going. Yeah. We can't have, like, a BFA launch or a Shadowlands launch. 
Uh, because uh, for one thing too, like the market is so saturated and there's so many different things for people to do with their time and money compared to 2004, you know, even within world of Warcraft. So, yeah. Right. So, you know, I, I think they, they have to, they have to make sure that like, once we're in, we're in like deep, deep into beta, if there's stuff that people really don't like, they can't go shadowlands on it yeah. and go yeah. bear with us. We think you're going to think it's cool. Like, yeah. You know, so that's that's my hope. But it, this was a really cool. Uh, it was it was some cool insights. I, there is the link to the the Inven um, write up about the talk in the show notes. Again, it you know it's it's English to Korean, and then in my case, I'm using Google to automatically translate it back into English. It's not. You know, it's not something that you'd see in like a magazine, but you can get the gist of what John was talking about. I think it is worth if you have ten minutes, check it out, and hopefully we get the video, man. I, I would love to actually watch this presentation. Yeah, me but... too. Me too. The the one thing before we move on from it that I, I wanted to cover is there's a slide we didn't really go over all that much, which is what led to their success, and I think it's important to highlight a couple areas of this. Um, they talk a little bit about their timeless visual style and how it's relatable and bright colors and exaggerated features. And like, like obviously the world looks great. Everyone knows that they know that high fantasy is important. It's a global appeal There's approachable as far as the setting goes for people. The things I wanted to highlight in this is evolving gameplay as a category. They talk about respecting players time, which is something right now with thunderstorm that I am talking about about saying, hey, let's respect players' time, make rewards earnable faster. So I do think that they need to really embrace some of the things on these slides. Uh, they talk about iterating, which Plunderstorm is an iteration of World of Warcraft and, and doing that, and I think that's great, as well as just within the games themselves, iterating on different systems and improving things. And they talk about involving, improving systems. But the other category I want to highlight is community, because this is one where we often feel a little bit like the ugly stepchild sometimes during some of this stuff. Um, they talk about the community being caretakers of their game. They talk about the network effect of, hey, if we actually link up with community creators and the community of the game, we can essentially boost our own numbers and our reach and our appeal by doing that. And they also talk about always having something new for community to sort of focus on and talk about and do. Um, I, I, I see this on the slide and I'm like, someone who designed this slide and presentation knows this like recipe to success for this company. It's frustrating when I don't see that happening with the company. So I, I am hoping that this is basically their way of saying, hey, we have learned our lessons going forward. There are people in the right places that will embrace these things and carry them forward. Um, I think that would be very nice if that's the case, because there's a slide here that talks about the community and caretakers and the network effect and always having something new and respecting players' time. So these things to me are all crucial elements, in my opinion, of their success. And times where they have not done these things are times where players have been very upset and times where people have left the community and times when people who support the community by creating content have left the community. So I, I really want them to do more in these categories because <laughs> I don't feel like they currently do. I, I think it's great that we're starting off with this big streamer event. I will say a streamer event like this, and I'm, I'm just going to caveat this. I fully understand why they invited the people they did. This is a new game mode. They want to get as many eyeballs on it as possible as they possibly can bring in large streamers who have their own audiences who might not necessarily play world of Warcraft to be able to broadcast this to as many people as possible. There are other opportunities where they could be bringing in and highlighting other content creators um, like ourselves, for example, uh, where I would love it if they did that more often. I would love it if there was a regular weekly post on the Blizzard website that actually highlighted several content creators as opposed to the few ones that they seem to highlight regularly. I would love it if there was more reach for events that are taking place or announcements that are taking place where they give different content creators, opportunities to be involved in those things. And I feel like we have started the ball rolling in that direction because I've seen little bits and pieces of, the, of this along the way over the past few months. And I'm hoping that that just builds as a snowball rolling down a hill into them really embracing community and what the community does for their brand uh, because that would be huge. And along those same lines, hey, we don't know if there's gonna be a BlizzCon or not, but you know that's a big community event that involves a lot of community and coming together and the network effect and announcing all the new things. So that's the entire category of community. So 
Uh, it'd be nice if that actually did happen, even if they're hiring an outside company to run the thing because they don't want to plan it themselves. I still think it'd be better off having an event than not. Oh, wow. I just realized it's like almost time potentially for BlizzCon news to start up if they're good. I mean, or we don't couple, really know. A month or two away. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, it could be it could be potentially as early as next month, which is only like yeah. n- next week at this point. So yeah. um, that's really weird to think about. And mm-hmm. I, I don't know, man. I mean, we are in uncharted territory now with Microsoft ownership and, and everything. Who knows? I mean, yeah. Is Microsoft going to want to run the event? Are they going to let the event run as we've known it before? I mean, I think that is a huge part of, of like WoW's continued like continuity and goodwill towards it. You know, it's it's it really does bring the players who care the most together in in a in a way that nothing else really can. And I mean, I I think last year's show was it was it was pretty good. It was uh, it was understandably kind of kind of weird, but like obviously they you know it it still felt like. They wanted to present a lot of information to the community and and you know center the presentation around that. So that was that was really cool. Um, the number one feedback for that BlizzCon is more seating. Period. Yeah, we need to sit down. Yeah, please. Just, Thank you. Just, like you, you're going to invite thirty thousand people to a space, and you're going to have three hundred chairs. Like, let's just be clear. That's unacceptable. You need to have seating for people. It's just silly not to. So. That's my number one feedback. Yeah, for but so you know, I but we'll you know we'll see what ha- what ultimately happens with that. I mean, I I do think there's plenty of different ways to engage the community overall, and it kind of goes in cycles. You know, I think they've overall been trending up with it, but then again, you, you, this whole last cycle is so because it, 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 it feels like we were just in this vacuum for two plus months waiting for ten dot two dot six. You know, so my initial. Like my my recent experience is like, well, you know, it's just been this kind of closed door, right? All the stuff's in the vault, and then we're kind of blindsided by a bunch of stuff. And this was a special case; they were doing something more experimental. I get that, uh, and I think overall, like they have done a pretty good job of letting us see a little bit more down the road. You know, doing even just doing the roadmaps and stuff. I think it's been a huge philosophy shift yep. that we never would have gotten a few years ago. So. Yep. Uh, I think that stuff really means a lot to players and, and lets people kind of understand what is in store and what like maybe plan their, their wow schedule. If they're not sort of, you know, the perpetual rotating 12 month subscription, like I might be where I'm always playing something inside a wow, even if I'm not playing it a lot. Uh, I think that stuff is, is huge in terms of uh, transparency and, and, trust just establishing that with your players like hey here's what we have going on you should come check it out if you want to and this is what we're going to do and then delivering on that stuff and yeah. so far they've been able to do that yeah no i i, I i'm look i'm hopeful for what we have coming and i'm really hopeful seeing the numbers of subs and the growth happening abnormally as they sort of list this is record numbers of subscriptions right now in a post-launch uh period for an expansion so uh, that's very hopeful. That's very good news and very positive news. And that's contributed through all of the different levels of World of Warcraft, like everything about the product right now that's creating that growth. Uh, so I'm I'm pleased and I'm hopeful for what they could do going forward. So I'm hoping that we keep the momentum going. We get more news happening more frequently. We get community creators involved in a lot of things. We hope to grow that and really please players by listening to players and, you know, listening to the feedback that people are given. So hopefully we're, we're in a really good place. All right. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, want, I just want to mention yep. uh, just one more thing on that as we transition out is yep. uh, just by way of example, we know we do have season four PTR tomorrow. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> like we are getting, we are getting back into it where everything's spinning back up, which I kind of figured would be not too long on the heels of 10.2.6 mm-hmm. actually mm-hmm. coming out. So we will have plenty of, new info and and uh you know a kind of that look ahead you know as early as tomorrow yeah and like i said next week's show is going to be focused on season discovery phase three on top of that season four stuff that's coming out because we'll talk about the phase three stuff and what's happening with that announcement during next week's show so that's going to be you know even more info for that product and what's going on with it all right i want to take a moment to thank our patrons they contribute to a ton to our show and help us to improve on the content we create Today, I'm giving a special shout out to Aliana, Sarajian, James, Kapawi, Max, Pinky, Shoral, and Rager. Thank you so much for all that you give, as well as all of our patrons, including our newest ones. Uh, we have to give a shout out to Arden N, as well as Richard O. Thank you so much for hopping in to support the show. 
and uh, and letting us know that uh, you are able to help us keep the lights on with this product, keep it on your listening devices, and allow people every week to download it because, yeah, we like making the show, and as long as you all keep supporting it and listening to it, we're certainly going to keep making it. So if you want to join the Patreon, you go over to patreon.com slash the starting zone, and you can hop in there and support. If you do, uh, be sure you're also joining our Discord. You get a special role in our Discord, depending on the tier that you support at. And uh, you can, you know, chat with us there and hang out with us there. And lots of discussion is happening right now as lots of things are happening around the game right now. And we have ways of, like, helping you find a raid team and recommendations on playing the game and help on what you should be doing rotation-wise and tons of knowledge. It's like a whole little knowledge bank of all the people that we have that chat over there. So by all means, feel free to hop into our Discord, startingzone.com slash Discord. We'll get you a link there and you can hop in. But yes, thank you to all of our patrons. You all just keep the show going like this. This is a Monday night after I've worked a, a long day and I work an even longer day tomorrow. And I'm here doing this because I want to be sure we get our weekly episode in and it's out to you guys. And we're as consistent as we can be in doing that. So thank you. We appreciate all your support. And uh, yeah, shout out to uh, to Arden N and Richard O. Absolutely. Uh, welcome aboard, new patrons. Thank you for the support, and and thank you all patrons, uh, past and present, for supporting mm-hmm. the show over over the years. I, I, you know, again, it's the show's fifteenth birthday yep. today, and um, you know we've had the Patreon up since to, uh, what twenty seventeen, and so you know it's meant a lot over the years to have the support and to be able to produce a show at the level we want to, and to keep the archives online for you if you want to dive in and listen to some fifteen year old episodes, you can do that. So. Um, patrons make that possible. So, so thank you all so much. And yeah, definitely hop in the Discord, especially if you need a place to vent about how much you hate grinding Plunderstorm oh, yes, for the stupid too. pirate cosmetics. Yes. I'll be happy to do that with you anytime you want. <laughs> I am there. I'm ready to complain about Plunderstorm. Let's go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you want tips and tricks and stuff that we didn't get enough out of the episode, obviously more people are there to share those as well, if that's something you're looking for too. And if you want another great way to support the show, you can head out over to your iTunes, your Apple podcast, and leave us those five star reviews. They really help out the show, boost us up those charts, and we love reading the ones that we get here from our listeners. This one comes in from Bad Game 0711, uh, and it's entitled Great for Returning. It says, as a returning player, this show has kept my hype alive. Well, thank you for uh, writing the review. We appreciate it. And yeah, I'm glad that we're able to keep you going. There's a lot of people who listen to the show and don't play the game because they just want to know what's going on in the game and see if it's the right time for them to come back or if they need to pop in for, you know, a one month renewal on their sub to check something out. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's great. I think it's, it's wonderful that we have an audience that is out there working hard and in some cases just wanting to know what's going on in the game. So thank you so much to everyone who supports. We love those reviews. Let's keep those reviews coming. They do really help out the show a lot. So thank you for that. Yeah, thanks for writing in. And I feel like, you know, the returning player thing is um, it can be a, a tough space to be in because you have a relationship with the game, right? And you have stuff about it you like. Mm-hmm. You like it enough to come back to play it again after you stop playing it. But then it can be really hard to navigate. Stuff changes in WoW quite a bit. And mm-hmm. Dragonflight changes faster than maybe any expansion has ever changed. And so, you know, how do you approach that? What is important to do? What is unimportant to do? Like, what? how do you prioritize your time? And that's a tough thing even for I think regular players to navigate as they continue to layer all this stuff into this expansion and so that is a really important I think topic for us to discuss on a regular basis of like what should you do this week and what is important and how do you get the most out of this experience at whatever level of play you might be at Um, and I mean as we were just talking about from, from John's GDC talk like there are a lot of returning lot. players. It, it is, you know, yeah. yeah. And I mean, you know, that I think that churn is is probably uh, becoming more frequent as people kind of get what they need and dip out and come back, you know, mm-hmm. for the next one and dip out. And then, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But I, I, you know, I think that's a challenge that maybe Blizzard doesn't address super well. So, you know, it provides us the opportunity to dig into this stuff a little bit more to help, you know to help out the returning player and say, okay, these are, this is your checklist yeah. for this week or this, Oh, you want to try this out? Well, here, here's a pitfall to avoid or whatever, because the game doesn't really provide that. And yeah. there's more of it all the time. They specifically highlighted that as one of the flaws of Shadowlands is that it was inaccessible when it comes to returning players. Like it just was a problem where it's like, Hey, you came back and you don't know what's going on. Well, that's a problem and you don't know how things work. So 
yeah, they don't, they, they know that's a problem and community is one of the things that helps solve that. So let's support the community a lot. All right. Um, that's going to wrap up episode 624 of the starting zone. If you want to check out show notes for this episode or leave us a comment on the show, you can head on over to the starting zone.com, the official website for the starting zone podcast. If you want to contact the show and leave us your feedback or ask a question, you can email us at the starting zone at gmail.com or reach out to us on Twitter, or you can hop into our discord at starting zone.com slash discord. Like I said, and you can uh, join over there and we can chat with you over there. If you want to get your hands on some TSD gear, some shirts or mugs or stickers, that kind of stuff, you can find that over at tpublic. That's teepublic.com slash stores slash the starting zone. Uh, and Jason, where can folks find you if they're trying to reach out to you on the internet? The best place to find me is over on Twitter. You can find me over there at Shieldwald. And you can also find me on Blue Sky over at Jay Lucas. I haven't been posting much of anything, really, but I haven't been posting on Blue Sky at all. But I am over there, and I do read it. So if you want to say hi to me on the internet somewhere, you can find me at those two places. Uh, the video channels are twitch.tv slash Shieldwald and youtube.com slash Shieldwald. They've been quiet, and I, they probably will be until season four, to be honest. You know, we're, we're down to one raid night a week, and I am not streaming Plunderstorm. <laughs> so uh, I just, yeah, that is not an experience anybody wants to have. But I, you know, I will fire them up for, for new season stuff for sure, uh, which is probably about a month away or so, I think. So check out those video channels in the meantime. We'll, get, we'll fire them back up in just a little bit here. All right. If you're trying to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Spencer underscore Downey or over on uh, Blue Sky at uh, Spencer HD. You can also find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Spencer HD or on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Spencer HD. And with that, for Jason and myself, we want to say thanks for listening and jobs done.